We're going to be talking about anamorphics and specifically a really interesting combo that you may not have seen. I don't know that I really got this from anywhere other than I just thought I'd test it out to see if this combo would work. I haven't seen this recommended anywhere else. Maybe someone else has done it, but it works really, really well. But I'll first start with just saying that anamorphic shooting is not for everyone. Most of my projects, in fact, I'm not shooting anamorphic. It's not very practical in terms of speed and efficiency on set. It's really gonna slow you down. And a lot of the times, if it's a client project or whatever it is you're working on, doesn't always require that anamorphic look because if you're shooting anamorphic, it's not just to crop the top and the bottom. Of course, you can do that with letterboxing, however however you want. You can pick whatever aspect ratio you want and do it all in post-production. No, if you wanna shoot anamorphic, it's to get a certain anamorphic look. And it's not just the lens flares either. There's definitely a certain style to it. And so I'll say like, I don't shoot with this lens hardly at all, but if you're interested in anamorphic shooting, I thought I'd share at least this combination to see if it might be right for you. Now, to get right down to it, this is a two-piece combo. So the front of this is the SLR Magic Anamorphot 50. It's a 2X anamorphic. I specifically got the 2X because if you're gonna shoot anamorphic, you might as well go all out. 1.33 is all right. It's like a decent anamorphic squeeze, but 2X is really where it's at that's gonna give you like much more exaggerated characteristics of the anamorphic lens. And then the back, which is really, you know, the taking lens, this is where kind of, I don't know, just everything just clicked. I've used the, uh, the anamorpha in a lot of other lenses that it doesn't really perform as well, and we'll get to that, but this is a cheap old lens. It is actually the Mikey 35 millimeter 1.4 micro four thirds lens. Yes, this is a micro four thirds setup. I'm sorry if that disappoints you. This particular combination works best on micro four thirds. Now, the anamorphot you can use on a super 35 camera lens, you can use it on a full frame camera lens, but you're gonna be a little bit more limited in terms of what lenses you can pick and use with it. They're gonna need to be a little bit longer than 35, otherwise you're gonna get porthole and all these annoying things. You really, you're taking lens, you're back if you're doing a setup like this. Now, granted, there are a lot of cool anamorphic uh, lenses coming out. There's the Siru line of lenses that are anamorphics that are all just like one lens. SLR Magic also has some already pre-built cine lenses that you can get. So there's a lot of anamorphic options out there. There's some high-end ones. But if you're looking for something like this where you have kind of your anamorphic adapter lens and then your taking lens and you're putting them together, I find this combination actually works pretty well. And again, it's this cheap Mikey 35 millimeter, it's $100. And then if you look at the SLR Magic Anamorphot 50 2X anamorphic adapter, it's like $1,000 brand new if you're buying it from B&H. But you probably can find it on eBay or elsewhere, maybe a little bit cheaper. But I do really like this one because it is that 2X. Some of the newer ones, like the Siru uh, lenses, they're only 1.3x, which works if you're shooting 16 by 9. But the great thing about Micro Four Thirds and this combination is that obviously you're going to use it with something like a GH5, a GH5S, something that lets you shoot anamorphic 4x3, which is really what you want a 2x anamorphic for. You want to shoot proper 4x3 anamorphic so that you can stretch it 2x and get that nice cinemascope aspect ratio. The Blackmagic cameras can also do this. So the Ursa Mini or the Pocket Cinema cameras can also do anamorphic, but really there aren't that many other cameras out there that do it well in the same way. The GH5, you can actually have stabilization going while you're shooting anamorphic, which is kind of a, a unique aspect to that camera. So why does this work so well? Well, not only is it incredibly cheap for an anamorphic setup, Many other taking lenses that I've used with this adapter don't really work all that well. So of course there's the famous Sigma 18 to 35. If you shoot with a GH5 or any kind of crop sensor camera, you probably know of the Sigma 18 to 35. Wonderful zoom lens does not work all that great with this anamorphic lens. You're really looking for a taking lens that has a smaller front diameter. So if I unscrew this off of here, you can see that this is a 49 millimeter front and I have an adapter uh, step up ring on here that takes it to 62, which is the back of the rear element for the anamorphic. So 62 on the back and then it's 77 on the front for filters or whatever else you wanna add. So if you had a variable ND or something like that. And that's the combination, you put them together. I also find that these kind of cheap mechanical 
just like basic, basic lenses do a lot better than some of the fancy autofocus lenses that are out there. Uh, this has manual aperture and manual focus, and both rings are de-clicked, which is nice. And they're kind of tough. I don't know how to describe it other otherwise. They're just very kind of stiff. So a lot of times if you're shooting with a combination of two lenses and you're changing focus, you're changing aperture and like things can get bumped and mess everything up, throw it out of alignment. It's kind of nice that this lens works as well as it does, just kind of holding its position, holding everything in place and you're not gonna lose a spot while you're in the middle of a shoot. Also what works really nice about this setup is that it's relatively sharp. Many other anamorphic lenses, um, or at least taking lenses that you pair with an anamorphic can be really soft and you have to stop way down to like f4 or 5.6 until they really sharpen up. Thankfully, this combination does work well, but again, it is anamorphic. So we'll look at some test footage and I'll show you kind of what I mean as far as the, the look and feel. But yeah, the 35 millimeter just screws right in here, just like that, no problem, just screws right on. And then there is a back ring that can kind of get your alignment. Cause obviously just screwing this on, your anamorphic might be misaligned. And so you would just have to rotate it and kind of tighten it. There's a little ring on the anamorphod for that, but that's a minor technical thing. Anyway, let's take a look at some test footage over here in Premiere. And before we get into this, I just want to say this isn't anything glamorous. This isn't anything fantastic. Like I said before, I don't shoot with this lens all that often. So these are just some test shots I got with this combination showing you kind of what the look and feel of the combination is in case you're curious. So let's take a look at that in Premiere. Here we have a shot uh, filmed kind of overcast day next to a window. This is shot with the GH5 in V-Log. And this is actually 4K60, which is nice that the GH5 lets you shoot slow-mo anamorphic. Another nice little helpful thing there. So this isn't the full maximum 6K anamorphic that you can do on the GH5. Uh, this is the 4K60 and it's shot V-Log. So there's a, a LUT applied that you can see. If you just are curious, that was before and then there's with the LUT. So it's a 2X anamorphic. So you'll see under here, under the width, we've got it stretched two times, which is what you wanna do. This footage comes in, no, not like that, not 50. Uh, it comes in like that. So four by three looks really weird, looks really squished. That's the point of shooting anamorphic. So when you stretch it back out to the proper, what it's supposed to look like, it's very, very wide. And I'll blow this up even bigger if you wanna take a look at it there. And we can scrub through some of these clips and you can kind of see the look and the, the, the kind of the vibe of the anamorphic here. Um, you'll see a lot of like bowing at the edges. 35 is about as wide a focal length as you can use for a taking lens with this anamorphot on micro four third. If it's super 35, you're probably looking at like a 50 millimeter lens as being your widest lens. And then if you're full frame, maybe it's upwards of like 70 millimeters or above where you're really gonna want, you know, that focal length to start and then gets tighter from there. So you can see at the edges, there's a lot of bowing, uh, which is part of the anamorphic look. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. It is what it is. That's how anamorphics look on the wide end anyway with this adapter. If you're shooting more, you know, cropped in with a longer uh, focal length as you're taking lens, you'll get less of that effect. But really, I like when I'm shooting anamorphic, I kind of want it to have that ultra wide, as wide as I can get look while still being sharp and keeping things like shallow depth of field, etc. Lots of bowing on this shot. You can see on the corners, the edges, everything's just like curved and kind of like going towards the center. But we're not portholing, you know, we're not actually seeing the anamorphot um, that you can, that can happen if you're any wider, like if you shoot with like a 24 millimeter focal length, which is what I tried initially, uh, not gonna work out for you. So you can see uh, how this looks. It isn't the sharpest image necessarily, but it's also pretty sharp for what it was. I'm, I'm pretty sure I was almost wide open. I don't know if I was exactly 1.4 or if I was F2 for this stuff, but you know, relatively shallow depth of field, you're getting that background blur. Um, but you're still keeping stuff relatively sharp, not as sharp as you know a pristine modern lens that's meant to be uh, pixel perfect. This is a little bit more of that uh, stylized cinema look, if you will. And ignore the color grade if you don't like it. It's just a LUT applied. There's nothing uh, special or fancy going on there, so you could you know color it to your liking. Here's some additional shots that were shot Cinelic V um, as well. 
pull these up full screen so you can see them a little bit better. Again, you can see you know the straight lines on the edges are kind of curved, but we have some really nice sharpness here. I'll zoom in to 100% so you can take a look. Not the sharpest, mind you, but definitely sharp for this kind of setup. If you shot with these anamorphics before where it's an adapter and a taking lens, it's, it's really hard to get it right. And thankfully the SLR Magic uh, Anamorphot has a, a focal ring on itself. So you, you have to dual focus um, sometimes where you're adjusting focus on two different lenses, which can also be kind of irritating. Like I said, shooting anamorphic is not fast or efficient. I don't do it a whole lot, but you can if you want that certain look. But certainly uh, sharp enough for uh, certain types of projects. And you will notice that certain setups, like the distance you are from the subject really matters in terms of being able to get it in focus because you have two lenses. So you're focusing here on the anamorphot, like so you have your kind of normal, uh, you have your near, near mode and then normal that go back and forth and also anywhere in between. So there's many times where I find myself, I'm not really near, I'm not really normal, I'm kind of in between on the anamorphot and then I'm also adjusting focus on the 35 millimeter, the Mikey lens. So you really have to play with that distance you are from the subject to really get it right. You'll, you'll be messing around saying, I can't get in focus. I can't get in focus. It's just, it's just nothing, nothing is looking sharp. And it's usually a combination of one or the other or both really dialing it in. And once you play around with it a little bit, you get kind of used to the way it wants you to focus where you kind of set the anamorphot kind of first where it's like, as sharp as it can get, and then you dial in the taking lens for that extra sharpness. Uh, at least that's how it usually ends up working out for me, but it really depends on the distance from your subject and how that changes shot after shot after shot. So I do find times where like, you know, I'm, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a decent uh, a distance from the person and uh, it just maybe I have to do some adjustments on the lens to get it perfectly nailed in there. So you can see not a lot of like flaring happening. I don't have any direct lights pointing, you know, into the lens, but it should give you a kind of sense of how things look here. If I zoom in here to 100%, take another look. Again, this is a low light situation. So again, like that's pretty decent, I'd say, for just like taking a test shot here. Um, no lights, just whatever's in the, in the pizza place and you know, maybe some people like that, maybe you don't. It's up to you, uh, personal preference, I suppose, um, and what you think looks good. It definitely could look better, but you can get some playback there. So I slowed it down, it's 4K60. So you get a sense of kind of what it looks like, feels like. And here's a, a, a shot where I'm like a little bit too close for where it wants me to get focus. So you'll notice it's not quite as sharp as it was before, because I'm a little bit too close for the combination of settings. So there's even an additional uh, front element you can put on here to focus even closer. So you can get, it can get out of control really, really fast to where it's just not always practical to shoot that way. Many times you're like, I'll just be better off letterboxing it in post-production if I want that look anyway. And you maybe don't want to deal with the softness or you don't like the bowing in the corners and you might think, Anamorphic just isn't for me. Well, other people might look at it and go, oh, that looks really cool. I like that. It's unique. It has character. Because that is the thing about anamorphics. They have an aesthetic and a style that you can't really replicate with just a, a generic spherical lens. It's going to look you know, accurate. Lines are going to be straight. It's going to be the way most lenses look. If you want that special anamorphic look, it definitely needs to match the project. And that's why I say 95% of the time I'm not shooting with this. It's only every once in a while that I'll pull it out just kind of for fun or for specialty things uh, here or there where it just feels like it needs that certain something else. But most of the time you're probably fine with spherical. I don't think there's anything else to go through here. So just uh, kind of clicking back through. Like, uh, you know, I think this stuff it has that nice shallow depth of field. Things are still sharp. It has the anamorphic aspect ratio. It has that anamorphic characteristic. And it's, uh, you know, up to the personal preference of the shooter, of the viewer, of what they like and what they don't like. Great thing is with this combination, it's not too terribly expensive. And there are other ones out there. I just wanted to share this one because I have it. You know, it's personally, I've used it. And this seemed to be like a really good 
lens if you have an anamorphic or some other kind of lens, you know, an anamorphic adapter lens where you need a taking lens. These cheap, I'd, I'd recommend look for cheap lenses, small, small front diameter. So this one again was 49 millimeter front diameter on the Mikey lens. So small front diameter, probably, you know, metal mechanical construction. Don't look for anything fancy. Look for cheap, bare bones, basic lenses, even some old, you know, vintage lenses might work well for you but something around there. If you go wider than 35 on micro four third, you'll start to see the the inside of the anamorphic. You'll see the uh, it'll porthole on you. You'll see the inside of it. So 35 is about as wide as you can go. And hopefully you can kind of see that in those shots where you're really getting that. Like it's really, really stretched on those corners, but definitely a fun thing to play around with if you're curious. And I'm sure you could probably pick this stuff up used a little bit cheaper than what it is brand new. Even this lens, let's see, is there like a used price on here? People sell it used, I don't know, it's a hundred bucks. And it's a cool, fun, you know, 1.4, 35 millimeter lens for a micro four third. You don't have to use it with the anamorphic. You certainly could just use it as is for regular video and regular photography, although it's not gonna autofocus. So if that's important to you, obviously not a consideration there. The anamorphot, would I recommend it? I've talked about it, I mean, years and years ago is when I first got it. And it's really that thing where it's only for the specialty uh, moments and occasions. It's not something that you need or have to have. Uh, I think in general, anamorphic is kind of that way. It's very tempting, it's very attractive because it has beautiful characteristics in certain situations, but it can be a pain to shoot with. So just keep that all in mind. Don't look at it too much like eye candy of like, I have to have it that looks so cool and I have to spend the money. Maybe play around with it, dip your toe in the water, like start cheap before you go all out and you really invest into, you know, wanting to shoot everything anamorphic and then realizing this just doesn't fit your workflow. Cause it can easily, easily take away from a project cause you, it'll just eat up your time cause you're fiddling with like the technical stuff of like getting the focus right instead of focusing on the other things that are more important, like maybe lighting and direction and all that other stuff that happens on set. So just something to keep in mind, but I do recommend if you were looking for a taking lens, check the, you know, hundred dollar Mikey lens out. It's a, a fun lens to play around with. And then, you know, this is a relatively compact, decent setup, not too big, not too heavy. You definitely don't have to have rails. It's probably a good idea to help support the lens, but you don't have to. So you can make it work. And, you know, something like a GH5 being micro four third, it is kind of the perfect combination since the GH5 is so good at shooting anamorphic anyway. I'm going to pop over in the chat. How's everybody doing? What's this anamorphic A? Now we're talking. Yeah, Voigtlander would be killer. Oh, for sure, for sure. The Voigtlander lens would be great. I just don't have any. I do like my Voigtlanders with anamorphics. Check out Rapido Technologies. They make housing and focus solutions for anamorphic lenses that are quite cool. Oh, interesting, I've never heard of them. I'll check them out. Rapido Technologies. Let's pull it up, let's take a look. It's a Friday night, we're just hanging out. So that's why I changed the uh, background lighting back there, just kind of more like fun party vibes on a Friday night. Rapido Technology, this looks cool. What do they do, what do they do? The Rapido Anamorphic Full Package. It's a front variable diopter, a full metal front metal jacket, rear metal jacket, step down ring, step up ring. Oh, awesome. I've never heard of uh, this company, but that's really cool. Let's see. Close up. Let's see. Clamp front products, the full package. Take a peek here. What are we looking at price wise? Ooh, $1,000. Hey, now you're talking. That's not bad at all. Anamorphic projection lens, uh, everything in one package. The front variable adopter. Cool. I'll I'll do a little bit uh, more of a digging on this because I definitely like the price point, and that looks nice all in one. Certainly a good solution. All right, back in the chat. I wouldn't want a dual focus, must have a single focus solution. Some people are faster at it, but it's still slower. Uh, the serial lens look interesting other than the colors not matching. I just wish I had a larger stretch than 1.33. 
yeah, that's the problem with the Siru uh, 1.33, which is why I kind of wanted to do this video talking about this setup specifically because it is 2X. Um, and it's around that price point, $1,000. Maybe the Sirus are more expensive or cheaper, but it's around there, also micro four third. So just something, another option to look at because it's just stuff that I kind of like pieced together over the years. I bought the Anamorph out a while ago and then it was just recently that I picked up the Mikey because I was just like struggling to find a good taking lens. I was like, everything I have, it's just too big. It's it's a zoom lens or it's just like a, a modern prime with a really big front uh, diameter. So finding something that was a little bit smaller, more compact, ended up working out rather well. And it's so cheap. That was a nice little bonus. Tito Ferritin's anamorphic cookbook and his anamorphic calculator is a great tool. Yeah, I've seen some of his uh, videos a while ago. I haven't seen anything of his recently but uh, he was doing a bunch of anamorphic videos years ago that were very well done and a lot of variety, different ways to do it. What kind of stuff do you shoot most? It honestly depends. I don't know if there's one type of thing I shoot the most. It's it's all over the place, really. Um, typically, it ends up being more like documentary style, um, but that's not to say they're specifically documentaries, but they definitely that that style of capturing interviews, um, sometimes it, it bleeds into like corporate work. Um, it really just depends. Sometimes it's fun passion projects. Sometimes it's things to pay the bills. It really runs the spectrum, but not like not music videos, uh, not doing a lot of those, not doing weddings, uh, anymore. I used to do weddings, uh, you know, every once in a while, but I don't really do weddings anymore. And is there anything else? Like it's not, it's not like broadcast style stuff. I don't know. I feel like the stuff I end up doing has a very unique characteristic to it that's like not easy to uh identify out there as terms of like what bucket or category it falls into but um it's definitely fun doing something different every day keeping me on my toes the price point is without the anamorphic lens just the housing and the focus solution oh i see steve i see so no anamorphic lens just the housing and focus for a thousand. All right, all right. Well, maybe not quite as exciting at first, but uh, the Nikon 51.8 pancake, 70 bucks. Let's look it up. I have a, I have, where's it at? I have an old, like a sort of, it's not old, but it's not new. Nikon 51.8 and back, at, I think I still have it somewhere. I think I have an old, old Nikkor 1.4 50 millimeter, but it's not the pancake. So. I don't know what the uh, Nikon uh, 50 mil 1.8 pancake. Typing with one hand. I'm gonna set this down. There's a uh, 50 mil. You said 70. Oh, there's the 70 dollar one. <laughs> 135. Yeah, these are. I love these older lenses. I have a few. I have like an 85, 50, 24. Um, but that's fun. 70 bucks for a little pancake lens you can shoot with. Yeah, absolutely. That would work well for the Ursa Mini, probably, I would, I would guess. Since, like, the obviously the Mikey, this Micro Four Third lens doesn't work on the Ursa Mini, you have to find a different lens. So uh, the Nikon could be a good solution. I should also pull out my old 50 uh, millimeter Nikon. I think I have. I think I didn't end up getting around to testing it because I had to order... Uh, a 52 to 62 step up ring because that's what my Nikon is, is a 52 uh, front diameter and I shouldn't have that particular uh, step up ring so I had to order that and then I've been distracted with other things so I never got around to testing it. I do have that adapter ring somewhere now so I could test that with the Ursa Mini and see how it performs but when I've done anamorphic testing in the past between the GH5 and the Ursa Mini it all kind of roughly shakes out um, because the GH5 has the stabilization. You can technically, I think on the GH5, if I'm remembering correctly, you can technically shoot higher resolution on the GH5, but then obviously you don't have raw. So it really comes down to like what you want. And then the GH5 is much smaller. So it's, you know, pick your pick your flavor. What do you want it to, to do? What do you want it to look like? But I definitely would have a, a good time testing it on the Ursa Mini. Pop back in the chat. I'm mm, just wondering if you specialize in one or two things. No, I don't specialize in one or two things. I am, I kind of like how I like my cameras, like this Swiss Army knife. Like I 
do a little bit of everything. Uh, for a while, it was a lot of food, photography, food video type stuff. Um, but it's also been documentary, um, testimonial type stuff, product videos, explainers, uh, corporate stuff, live events, you name it. It really kind of runs the spectrum. Done a little bit of everything over the years. Do you consider the combo Mikey and SLR Anamorphot 2X are sharp? And what will be the actual focal distance with this combo shooting with the GH5 on 4x3 mode? So it's sharp enough. I, I, sharp, that's a like a relative term. It's definitely not as sharp as just a spherical lens. So if absolute sharpness is your most important thing, then anamorphic probably isn't right for you anyway, because to actually get that, it's going to cost you a crazy amount. So to do it cheaply and have it be really sharp is kind of difficult. Although the Siru lenses, I do think from people seem to be excited about them and they like what they offer, but it being a 1.33 stretch just isn't enough for me. And so I've, uh, at that point I would, you're not going to get really that much stretching anyway. So I would just, I would just crop it and save the hassle of shooting anamorphic because it is no matter what, it is going to be not as perfect as just a plain spherical lens and then just cropping it, letterboxing it. That does the trick for most viewers, right? Most people see that, you know, and they think, oh, it's a movie, it's a film, it's a it's a premium TV show. So you don't even have to shoot it with the actual anamorphic glass to give it that look. You can just do it in post-production and most regular viewers don't know the difference. Now, if you know what you're looking for, you'll look at the bokeh, you'll look at you know the corners, and you know, you'll kind of evaluate the image and go, oh, that's not anamorphic. But you're also not going to get super super stretchy bokeh, you know, from a 1.33. You're going to get more of that effect from a 2x anamorphic. So it's kind of what your priorities are. Keep in mind that the wider the lens, the more money in anamorphics. Sure, sure. Uh, not sharp. ISO is sharp. Some photographers use those 50 millimeter pancakes as lens caps. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good point. If you have a, just a cheap little tiny lens, pop it on there. My old Nikon vintage glass looks fantastic with the Metabone speed booster and the anamorphic on the OG black magic pocket cinema camera. That would probably be a nice little setup. And that's what I found with the anamorphics is get the old glass, get the cheap stuff, it doesn't have to be fancy. In fact, the smaller, the cheaper, the better, typically for those taking lenses. And it will usually be better off than buying some really nice, fancy, expensive lens and then trying to make it work with an anamorphic, and it just doesn't. GH5 has 6K all eye, but HDMI is disabled. Uh, the Rapido Anamorphic Lens Full Package C comes with the Super Cinelux Anamorphic Lens, but not the taking lens for 1350 See, that's not bad. If you want to get an anamorphic, I think it's going to be around that $1,000 price point. I do have a LA7200. So these old things. Before, like, there were more people making the anamorphic glass. <laughs> yeah. This. So this Panasonic AG LA7200. Oh, that was sold. Of course it was. Let's find a good, a good article. All right. Um, well, here it is on Amazon. So this was initially designed for the DVX 100 because it was a four by three sensor. And so you'd put this on there to make it 16 by nine. So it's a 1.33 anamorphic, but you can use it with 16 by nine and then stretch that to, what is it? 2.35 to one. So it's an old, old option. I wouldn't recommend it at this point, but uh, I do still have it and it's fun was fun to play around with at the time, but way too many workarounds and things you had to do to like make it look good. <laughs> Just a huge pain, but having fun, having fun. And I like that, like testing, experimenting, buying these cheap lenses, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. Cheap and fun. What will be the actual focal distance with this combo shooting with the GH5 on 4x3 mode? The actual focal distance? Well, I don't know how that works out because it would be, what would it be, 35 uh, top vertical, but then width-wise, is it half? Is that how the math works out? I don't actually know what the math would be of the, the focal width equivalent. Top to bottom, it's still 35 um, for as far as I'm aware, unless someone knows the math better than I do. But you're just getting that wider field of view 
but your vertical is the same as a 35. So I have, I have no idea. <laughs> um, we can talk about cinema cameras. That's probably where we're going to, we're going to go to next. Pull that up. It can be very tempting racing after the latest and greatest in camera technology, even though it comes with an expensive price tag. It seems worth it because like this stuff has great features. Maybe it's got 8K or maybe it has RAW or maybe it's doing high frame rates or some new helpful feature that's really, really expensive, very tempting. And it's that eye candy that we're all kind of drawn to. We really want these cameras to do their best so we can make the best looking footage possible. But the thing to remember is that cameras always go down in value. I don't think, I can't think of one single camera that's gone up in value over time. Maybe, you know, if it's an antique or, you know, an old relic that's really rare at this point. But for the most part, electronics in general and cameras specifically are going to lose their value over time. Even the high end cinema, cinema ones, even the most expensive camera right now eventually will be worth basically nothing. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of talk about that and look at it as we've kind of come through this kind of digital revolution of filmmaking and cinematography and DSLRs and, you know, back in the day with the red one, changing things up and going 4K, going raw, all this stuff that seemed so great 10 years ago is now just kind of whatever. And, you know, still maybe expensive relative to some other things, but much cheaper than when they first came out. And it just goes to show you, even if something's really, really expensive right now and you just really want it, if you just wait, if you don't actually need it right now, if you just wait, eventually it's going to come down to a price point that you can afford. So, for example, if you just go to eBay, and I encourage you to do this with any camera that you maybe wanted three, four, five years ago because you thought it was the best thing ever, the red Epic X, there's plenty of them. You can get 6,500 bucks. Here's a whole kit, $10,000. I don't know what this kit would have added up to brand new, but I'd imagine it was at least five times that amount, maybe more. You can just get the brain. Of course, red has so many SKUs in different models. There's the Epic X, the Epic M, so many different ones on here. But you can go look, what would your, oh, you want a red camera? Cause that was the coolest thing, you know? still is in some ways, right? The red Komodo or, oh, remember the red dragon? Oh, that was awesome. Or, you know, and now there's, you know, Gemini and helium and all these things. They'll eventually go down. They lose value. Even with a premium market like red, things still go down. If we were to look up like the GH3, because when that came out, it was, you know, before the GH4, before anyone was going 4K, GH3 looked like an awesome camera. Now you can get it for 300, 400 bucks, 500 bucks with a kit of stuff, looks like. 600 bucks for this one because it comes with two lights, and some accessories. How about the GH2? You can. Someone was talking the other day in the chat that they still shoot with their GH, GH2 because it's hacked. 200 bucks, 400 with the lens. These things come down significantly over time and to the point where you might not even think it's worth to sell it because you're going to sell a, a camera that's perfectly good and working and, and shoots footage to make 200 bucks. I mean, I guess recoup some of your cost, but, you know, let's look at the Aerie Alexa. You can get an Alexa Plus for $9,000, $8,000, Granted, that's an Alexa Mini. This is the problem with some of these cameras. They kind of, the new ones don't really change the name. So it pollutes with like the old stuff, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000. This is stuff people would have, you know, like died to have in their hands, you know, 10 years ago. Like, oh, okay. I, and it's like what they use for feature films, you know, they're shooting Avengers with this stuff. They're shooting the latest and greatest in, in Hollywood cinema with some of these cameras at some point in time. And then time goes on and new stuff comes out and we get this kind of distorted perspective perspective on the world that like you need the newest stuff you need the highest of the high end to do what Hollywood is doing or to make feature films but if you go look I mean when the red one came out that that was like the pinnacle of of excellence for digital cinema the red one now you can get one for two thousand dollars like this is going to be the the price of like this is like the price of a GH 
5S, brand new. But you could get what was at one point in time shooting Hollywood feature films. And it just feels like, I'm not recommending you go out and buy it, don't get me wrong. I'm not rushing to go buy a red one because there's some complications with that. It's not the best camera. But at the time, it was used to shoot things like, weren't they doing, oh, that was like the epic they did uh, for uh, The Hobbit and stuff. You know, Peter Jackson, but pick your pick your favorite person who's in Hollywood and, you know, the, the, your favorite director or cinematographer and if they're shooting digital and if they've shot red. You can buy the same cameras they used. You just might have to wait a little bit longer. And I'm not saying this to, like, rub it in of, like, oh, it's always going to be expensive for the new stuff and you'll never have it. No, the, the point is just to say the price of something expensive doesn't actually equate to the value of what you can do with it. So just because a camera is really, really expensive because it's brand new and that's what people are using to shoot what's happening now and putting it on a screen, just remind yourself that five, 10 years ago, it was way different, way different. Oh, a lot of these things have lasted that long, uh, that long. but it was very different uh, technology in terms of these cameras and now their price point is much more affordable. Even if you wanted, you know, uh, I don't know what else is there, like the 5D Mark III. I don't know what these go for. I'm sure people still like them, but like $1,000. And I think brand new, what was it? It had been like 3,000, upwards of that. So 800 bucks for a 5D Mark III. 5D Mark III for 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. It always comes down. Cameras always lose value compared to things like lenses or some of the other film equipment that you might have that really doesn't lose its value in the same way because it's kind of always valuable as long as that you know lens system is still popular and that camera ecosystem is still in use, people are gonna want those, those products. They're not gonna lose value as quickly as the electronic components that just lose value because the new ones come out and they're just way better. Glass, you know, with lenses are kind of at that point where they're not much more they can do technology wise to make them any better. So that's why they just, you know, switch the mounts out and they'll go from EF to RF and then you have to buy the same lenses all over again. And they, you know, do some optical optimizations there, but it's, you know, for the most part, a lot of the same kind of stuff. The technology is there. Same thing, well, not as true with lighting because that is a lot more electronic in nature and the advancements there have been relatively significant and quick over the past few years. So if you have some LED lights from a few years ago, probably not worth a whole lot you know, compared to what's out there now. And so those will lose value. But other things like C-stands and tripods, and things that just, the technology is not really gonna get that much better because it just does the job that it needs to do. It's like invest in that stuff for the long run and then don't feel ashamed if you have to buy a cheap camera because it's all you can afford because chances are that that cheap camera, whether it's a new cheap camera or you buy an old school cinema camera, either way, it's probably gonna be able to, in the right hands, take excellent pictures. Like the, the cinematography of an image is very little to do with the camera the camera is just what like takes the picture or records the footage. It's about all the other things around it. And if you get that that feeling of, oh, I, I'll never be able to shoot something that high end because I don't have access to that equipment, you can go get access to the equipment they had five or 10 years ago and it's not all that expensive. I wouldn't recommend you do it, but you can if you really want to. And I think it's just good to have that mindset you know, if you're looking at something like a GH5 and thinking that it's inferior for some way, for some reason, or a GH5S of, oh, that's not a real camera, that's not professional, you can't do anything good with it, you absolutely can. In a lot of ways, a GH5 is better than a Red One. Right now, they're, according to eBay, relatively the same price. And I feel like you'd get a lot more value out of something like a GH5, and you'd be actually be able to do a lot more creatively and stylistically than you'd be able to do with a Red One in 2020. So just always keep that stuff in mind. What else is there? The Blackmagic, there was the original cinema camera. The Blackmagic cinema camera came out very cheap when it first came out. Well, these are the new ones. I want the original, original. Yeah, there we go. 500 bucks. It's funny, you know, the cheap ones, they get cheaper, but from where they start to where they end up it may not be all that drastic. What about the Canon 1DC? Where's that at these days? What was this camera when it came out? I feel like that's much cheaper than when it first launched. And everyone loved the 1DC, rant and raved 
the most cinematic image Canon has ever made. It's incredible. It's beautiful. The 1DC. Now you can get it for 1700 bucks, 1300 bucks. How about like a C500 Mark I? If that comes up. Well, that doesn't give me anything. Let's see if we can find a C500. You know, proper filmmaker's camera. $5,000, $3,000, You know, because the stuff just, it comes, the new stuff comes out and the old stuff, people just ditch it and then they upgrade and then a newer version, a, a Mark II, a Mark III version will come out and the old stuff just keeps collecting dust somewhere and people are offloading it. How about a C300 Mark II? Because now the uh, Mark III's are coming out you know, relatively same price. And of course there's things that advance like autofocus, right? And ISO, like dual ISO and all this stuff that you can do with these newer cameras that makes them technically better. But again, don't forget that the best of the best a couple years ago is now sitting on someone's shelf collecting dust because no one wants it anymore. So they offload it. So if you're in that position where you're budget conscious, you're, you're worried about the quality of your work, I always say buy what you can afford and do the best you can with it. That's what I always try and do. I buy what I can afford and do the best with it. And usually that ends up working out really, really well because then if you're only investing what you can actually afford and you're using it to get paid work in return, that all that money you're making off of that, that work can go into investments for the higher end stuff, for the better stuff. And just remember though, that if you put all your money into a camera, it's like a car, it's gonna go down in value. You just lose money on these things. So if you're gonna buy a camera brand new, just make sure that you either, you can afford it outright and it's no problem, or that you are guaranteed you're gonna make your money back off of it because it's an easy trap to fall into. Well, I need to buy the best of the best so I can actually get work. And if you don't have work lined up and there's no way to recoup your costs, you're not going to, and you're gonna have to sell it later and you might only get 50% of your money back, 25%, I don't know, 75% if you're lucky like it's going to go down in value. So just something to always keep in mind as we're looking at the new stuff, it's really cool. Fancy technology, latest and greatest is great. Old technology made movies at that time and you can still do it now. So really it's just at the end of the day, buy what you can afford and do the best you can with it. Don't let a camera be your limitation. Let's see, popping over to the chat. Oh, someone was doing the math. Good, good, good. Uh, let's see for the anamorph. Um, what would be the actual focal distance? You double the width. So a 50 equals a 25 with a 2x. Okay, so you, yeah, you half the width. So that's what I did, right? I said it's a 35 top to bottom, and then a 35 divided by 2 is what? Like, uh, not quite, it was 18, 17 to 18, somewhere in there. Love my 40 year old Canon FDs, but. Again, that's on a crop sensor, so then you multiply it by two. So 17 times two, like you're back up at 35, and then the top to bottom is like a 70. So it's like, it's kind of funny how that works out. The GH5 is a 2X crop, so multiplied by 35, you get to a 70 you know, millimeter focal length equivalent for full frame, but then you put a 2X anamorphic and you stretch it out sideways, and so you're back down to 35 field of view, like what it should be full frame, but it's just because the anamorphic is a 2X and the crop is a 2X. That's funny how that math works out. I love my 40 year old Canon FD lenses, vintage flare and don't need a ProMist filter. Hey, there you go. I've uh, been doing some tests recently with some filters. I picked up a few Tiffin ones uh, in addition to some of my old stuff. Um, I did it way, way a long time ago. I'll pull it up here. I did a little test with some filters I had around and uh, just reignited my interest recently. So I posted this on my blog back in 2012. <laughs> what is that, almost 10 years ago now? Um, did a little test with some of the Tiffin, you know, warm black diffusion. Uh, there was the uh, Tiffin soft effects, which is actually on this camera right now, if you couldn't tell. That's the, the Black Pro Mist uh, half, and then the Tiffin Black Diffusion. So that was a filter set I had uh, way way back when. Still have it. So I used the soft effects on this lens, which I did change the lens. I'd be curious to know what everyone thinks. I switched it up a little bit because I was doing some autofocus testing 
uh, with this setup. It's not an autofocus now. It was it was working, but I figured someone would comment on it of it being irritating. Thought that it was slightly autofocusing. Maybe I'll do it one night just for fun. But uh, no manual focus right now. But I have the soft effects on there just because I like I like how it looks. But this is the 20 millimeter Lumix lens. So I did this way back when, and then recently I've just kind of reignited the passion for uh, filters and, and just making, you know, beautiful imagery, uh, how, however it is. So I've got some new filters that I'm going to test out and probably put a video together at some point. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Um, it seems like it's taken a long time to finally get raw video like the photographers have had for so many years now. Yeah. And it's, I don't know. I think in some ways it's good, in some ways it's bad. Raw can be a crutch if it's not, you know, I think we all have the benefit of we've been shooting, you know, 8-bit. We've been shooting with these like just severely reduced dynamic range cameras trying to make the most of it. And I think those challenges actually refine you and make you better because it is a challenge and a restriction rather than just saying, it's raw, do whatever you want. Like it's fine and fix it in post. I think that creates not at a high end, like for professionals, because obviously they are, you know, going to treat it the best way possible. So like, you know, if you know how to use the, the tools in your toolkit to the maximum potential, then obviously it's a good thing to have. But I think for on the amateur side, as people are getting into it, like raw can easily be seen just like I would say the A7S, oh, you can shoot in low light, so you don't need lights. Like that's false. But that was kind of the when the A7S first came out, that was the mantra. People were saying like, oh, it's so good, you don't need lights anymore. And it's like, wait, no, you still need to shape your image. You need light and dark and shadow to make it look good, look a certain way. You can't just shoot in any room any time just because it can shoot in low light. You still need the lights. So I think raw can be kind of the same misconception that people get tricked into thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't, I can just, you know, point my camera at a window and like, it'll be fine because it's, it's raw and I have the dynamic range. And it's like, yeah, but is that the best image? Is that what looks the best? Or should you refine it like we've always done historically? So raw is very, very powerful and very nice to have if you're a photographer or a videographer now that we have it, like with the Ursa cameras. I mean, red has had raw for a while, but just becoming more mainstream, more ubiquitous out there, more affordable and attainable for a lot of people. Now with ProRes RAW available on some external recorders with certain cameras, it's all fantastic to have, but just don't get too tricked into thinking like it makes it easier. In some ways it makes things harder because you just have to really know what you're doing and be better at it. Same thing is true I'd say for like the A7S. It's like, yeah, it can, but you still need, you still need lights if you want it to look good. Let's see. You can get an F900 for a few grand. It was easily 100,000 20 years ago when they shot Star Wars. I, I, I wonder how many of those are there? I'd be curious. Uh, I still love to shoot with a Sony F35. Amazing, amazing camera, but it's massive, old, and you'll have uh, to doctor it for power and recording. What else is there? There's the Sony F, there's the F, because they have the FX9 now, but yeah, all those like the F5, F55, F35, uh, there's so many fun cinema cameras that, you know, definitely aren't popular necessarily on uh, YouTube because it just wasn't practical for people to have them uh, 10 years ago making YouTube videos. Some people did for sure, but it wasn't like it is now where a lot of the, the talk is about m more of the affordable things, which everything seems to, even the new stuff seems to be more focused on affordability. I mean, even Red's going that direction with the Komodo stuff just being within reach. So people can buy it. And don't get me wrong, things like, you know, an iPhone are expensive, but relatively so to like, it's not a hundred thousand dollars. So even an iPhone, pretty expensive, thousand dollars. A new smartphone comes out, it's a thousand dollars. A new camera comes out, it's anywhere from like two to five thousand dollars if it's like a mirrorless hybrid. And so that range is what has that kind of mass appeal because it's not it's expensive, so it's an intentional choice, but it's not so expensive that you're like, well, I could just buy a car, but instead I'm just getting this tiny camera. Like that's the point at where like most people are like, yeah, that's not for me. I'm gonna go with the cheaper one. 
So I'm sure there's plenty of, of old fun cameras to that you might get your hands on if if it was like the one your dream camera that you always wanted. It's like wait till it becomes you know two thousand three thousand dollars, and then you can just have it as like a collector's item or something you play with for fun on fun shoots. Maybe use it for professional work because a lot of the stuff it still works. It still does the job, and it still looks just as good as when it first came out. It just might not have all the bells and whistles of some of the newer stuff. But the image is unbelievable. I think it was 100K when it came out. Yeah, good glass never dies. Yeah, that's what we're, people were even talking about with the anamorphics. It's like, oh, these old, you know, Canon FD lenses and Nikon lenses from, you know, 30, 40 years ago still have a use, which I can't imagine that the cameras that came out at that time, granted, if you're shooting film, sure, but, you know, like the first digital cameras, like the original 5D, is there anyone still shooting on the 5D Mark I? I'm sure there's somebody out there who who does, but they just the electronic stuff just gets dated so quickly. As a camera engineer, I would recommend you buy the best camera you can afford. It's better to buy an older video camera with pro features than a newer version with consumer features. Interesting, interesting take. I I wonder. It's like yeah, I would say buy the camera that does the job you need it to do. There are times where I need the smaller camera um, for the project and the type of shoot that it is. So a red one obviously is not gonna gonna cut it. Uh, I, I, did the red ones overheat? I think they had overheating problems. They had some issues. Um, big, bulky, kind of a pain to work with. Um, I think they maybe figured, fixed all that stuff though, maybe over time, but just kind of clunky. So it is about picking like, yeah, what you can, the best thing that you can afford. But I certainly would imagine if you're doing professional work, you know, getting, like a, a used, um, you know, semi dated, some of like the Sony cinema cameras or even the Canon ones that have come down in price now. It's like you're not gonna probably go wrong with that because it's gonna look great because it did five years ago. So it's still gonna look great and you can do awesome work with it. But it really just depends on the project. Let me see, catching back up. Let's see. Sorry, like the chat just bumped it's way ahead. Um, so I'll try and get through this and then we can move on. Crafting a great image with a potato was more impressive than using the latest and greatest. Yeah, that's true. If you're uh, just interested in image quality, color science, and filmic characteristics, the OG Blackmagic Pocket still makes incredible footage. You can get one for $400 to $500. Isn't that interesting? They're kind of like nothing is like $50. It never gets down to $50. It's still like $100, $200, $400, 500 because these tools all still work, they're all still functional. I, most of my cameras, I was talking about the other night and my GH1, I still have, because it just it wasn't worth it to sell it because I was still using it for jobs at the time. No frills, just pure image making. I remember the JVC 300, excellent micro four third camera. Of course I remember the JVC LS 300. I love that camera, although it is slightly not perfect in my mind, but I loved all the hardware, I loved they, they cut corners in ways like the LCD screen isn't all that great. It's kind of plasticky, but really affordable, really attractive for people who need those kind of pro features like XLR, uh, built-in NDs, like that. I think it has HDMI and SDI. There's just so much about it that's like really nice. I might be wrong in the HDMI and SDI, but I'm pretty sure that it had both, um, which also isn't like super common in really cheap cameras like the LS300. That JVC has still only dropped a couple hundred. Um, well, it's because, yeah, it wasn't all that expensive to begin with. It's all about the knowledge. Once you learn how to shape light, you can make an inexpensive camera look like gold. That is absolutely true, David. David knows what he's talking about. Yeah, I got a small forest of Minolta and Nikon vintage glass and a couple of Metabones boosters, a couple of Sigmas and Panda glass, and my old OG Pocket Rocket, a gimbal, and I'm set it's perfect for music videos, anamorphic. Excellent. Uh, Mikael, just dropping in to say, I'm glad to see you uploading more. Have a great night. Well, hey, DSLR video shooter. Good to see you, Caleb. Hopefully you're still here. If you're not, thanks for stopping in. And uh, you should stream more as well. And I'll hop into your live chat and we'll uh, hang out a little bit. Uh, Caleb's in the house. Caleb and Strong's live stream collab one day. Oh yeah, we should, for sure. Uh, good idea. L raw is literally raw. You're going to have to make the image everything from noise reduction to grading to color temp, more work to handle. Yeah, 
raw is raw. You've got a lot more information to play with, which can be dangerous in the wrong hands. It depends. But in general, it is a nice feature to have. Uh, I've been switching on the Ursa Mini to B-RAW instead of ProRes. So I've done a few videos talking about that. But just the, the flexibility of having RAW is really, really nice when it doesn't come with the heavy workload of some of old RAW workflows like Cinema DNG, which just like is much more of a nightmare to deal with. B-RAW works really, really well, and I can't recommend it enough. If you have any of the Blackmagic cameras and you haven't shot B-RAW, definitely test it out and, and play with it, have fun, because it is just as good as ProRes in terms of playback and speed and performance, plus all the extra benefits of the RAW functionality, which is excellent. Caleb says, it's been a while. I should dust off the old streaming setup. Dust it off, man. Dust it off. We'll, we'll stream together. We can hang out. Whatever, anytime. I always I enjoy your uh, live streams. I think last time I, I tuned in and you were talking about you got really sick and you resorted to a diet of soup, which is sounds really healthy actually, but also really unfortunate to be so sick that you have to eat soup. So I definitely uh, feel bad. Hopefully you're not going through uh, that today still. But you definitely should stream more because it's always fun. I think more people on YouTube should be streaming more. I think it's fun to hang out, interact, in this kind of quasi virtual way that we do, you know, hanging out in the chat here. It's odd, but I think it's also really fun too. Cause you get that. I only talk about what's in my brain at the time. So having questions, making me think about things I haven't considered before. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention that. Like it's very helpful to have that conversation back and forth rather than me just thinking, okay, yeah, I've covered all the points. And then someone says, well, what about this? You know, someone asked about the field of view or the actual focal length of the anamorphic. It's like, well, I don't actually know the math. I can think I kind of, is it probably half? And then someone else can chime in and say, yeah, you just, this is how you do it. And it's like that, I don't know. Like I've never thought like, oh, what's the actual field of view equivalent? Like it just is like, oh, it's just anamorphic, you know? But talking through that stuff is fun. Kelvin says, a discussion about interview YouTube lighting with you guys would be sweet. You two should do a good cop, bad cop episode. One defends the R5, one brutalizes it. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun, Trevor. Maybe I should stream too. I do have an 8 to mini here. D do it. Like, there. what, what, why not? Why not? Um, I mean, I guess it is it's effort and it's time and all that stuff. But it's pretty cool that we can stream as good as we can. I know it's not new anymore, but it still feels kind of new the the speed of interaction and the ability to do this when 10 years ago wasn't you know it cost much much more than what it costs now even getting a good quality camera into a laptop i mean i guess we have kind of gaming to thank for that because i feel like that's that's really what pushed that um into like being affordable like the mainstream gaming and live streaming type stuff and just being able to take hdmi and feed it into a laptop because before, you know, people were doing uh, Twitch type stuff, you know, like getting HDMI signal, you know, 1080 or like not even 4K, right? Just getting 1080 into a computer was a chore with the hardware. So it's really nice that this stuff is so affordable and you can set something up like this, you know, just in your house and make it work and do it mostly without interruption, fingers crossed. I did have that thunderstorm last night, but thankfully nothing happened. So I'm, uh, I'm, it's, it's just really thankful that we have this incredible technology that is very easy to take for granted. Also, the streaming quality is amazing these days. Well, hopefully that's this stream. Hopefully you're talking about this one, that it looks amazing. Uh, I did say like the lighting's a little bit different because it's Friday night. So that would just be a fun, fun hangout Friday night. But yeah, the streaming quality, hopefully, like this is only 1080. I could try and stream in 4K, I suppose. But I don't know, is there value there? Do people want to watch a stream in 4K? I'm sure some people do. But is it also necessary? I feel like 1080 is probably fine for a stream. Maybe not. Let me know. Lastly, if I'm all caught up in the chat, which it looks like I am. And yeah, thank you, uh, Caleb from DSLR Video Shooter, for hopping in. That's... Uh, very awesome to see him here. I am going to finally wrap this up by talking about photo and video. Lately, a lot of people have been saying, 
If you want a video camera, buy a video camera. Stop complaining about the photography cameras that don't have video features or they don't have the video features you want because that's really what it is. I've been talking about the Canon R5 and R6 and no, I'm not gonna go into all that. This is actually a positive video talking about the synergy between photographers and videographers or cinematographers or cameramen, whatever you like to call yourself. It doesn't really matter. Photo, photo people, video people, where they align. And I think it's really interesting when you think about this because a lot of the basic tools are the same lights, lenses, cameras. We're using the same stuff, speaking the same language, but there are a lot of times when photography and videography, you know, diverge. If you're doing photography, you only need that one frame to be perfect, so you have things like speed lights or strobes where you can get incredibly powerful light in an instant and freeze a frame, and that's not something you would even do with video because video is a sequence of photos. So you would have to strobe continuously, which is why we have continuous lights that aren't as bright as speed lights or strobes. So there are some things that don't always align, but I think there is a lot that we do have in common where why the hybrid model of camera means so much to so many people and why so many people want these cameras that do both photo and video to do them both well. And the one area that I think is the most obvious where it overlaps is frames per second which is kind of odd because most video is like, you want like 120 frames now, right? With the Sony a7S III, 4K 120, like that's incredible, or a thousand frames per second on a phantom camera or whatever it is. And you're also seeing these features creep in there like raw, you know, being able to shoot raw video, also interesting. And the fact that video is just a series of images, the better the video technology gets, it almost makes it better for the photographers who are almost always not always, often chasing after higher frames per second for the full resolution of their sensor. So if it's a 45 megapixel sensor and it can shoot you know, 10 frames a second, wow, that's incredible. Or a couple years later, it's say now 12 frames a second. Oh, and then it goes up to 16 frames a second on the newest camera. And then, oh my goodness, we're at 20 frames a second. Oh, I can get incredible you know, sports images or event coverage because I can do these amazing burst sequences of photos. And that's like the closer you're getting there, you're almost to 24 frames per second video. And so the better the video features get in terms of, you know, 8K raw, that should be helping photographers as well. These things go hand in hand, not in execution, not in practice in the way we use these tools, but in terms of the technology behind the scenes. Having 8K raw video means as kind of that you can do those really high burst speeds with these cameras for photography and capture that you know perfect action that you're going for rather than be limiting to like six frames per second and you miss the action, but you have a lot of megapixels to play with. So the better the technology gets, the more I think these two converge in a place where 10 years ago, Red was talking about, you know, digital stills and motion control. Was that DM DSMC? Digital stills in motion. The idea that you would have one camera that does really high-end video, cinema, but you would also, it's so high-end that you could also use it for high-end photography. That was, you know, their idea 10 years ago, and we've only improved from then. And I don't think there's any situation where a photographer is just gonna be shooting video and then pulling a still from it and saying, that's my print. I don't think that's practical. I don't think that's how photographers like to work. That's not how I like to take photos. I wouldn't wanna just record continuous video. It's just too much. At a certain point, it's too many frames, especially if it's 120 frames. The value there is playback in sequence that it's smooth motion. For a photographer though, to have those high burst rates is almost always a feature that they, they seek for like after on the camera that, oh, this one shoots faster than that other one, so I'm gonna go with the one that shoots faster. You also have things like the autofocus points and the ability to do really high-end autofocus. This is something that's becoming more and more of a need for videographers out there that only helps photographers as well who are struggling where they're taking those bursts and like one frame that they really wanted is the one that's out of focus. Well, the better it gets for video, the better it works for photography as well. And the more that these things can be seen as the same and a hybrid, that's at least the approach that I take, the model I take for my work because I do both photo and video work. 
Why would I want two separate cameras, two separate systems where I maybe even have two separate lens collections, one camera to do photo, one camera to do video? It doesn't always make the most sense. There are certain times and places where a person only does just video or someone just does photography, and that's fine. You can, there's no judgment there. You can operate however you like to work. But I know there are a lot of people as well who are asked time and time again, if they're shooting photos, someone will ask, hey, can you also shoot a video? And many, many times someone's shooting video and someone will ask, hey, can you also take a photo? So the more that you can do that in one camera and the better those thing, two things overlap, the more options we have as creators to focus on making the content because we're not worried about a camera overheating or the autofocus not working in certain modes or you have to, it's cropped in in a certain high frames per second mode, or I can do raw photo, but I can't do raw video. There's so many limitations for these things that once they all converge, I think it'll feel a lot better and there won't be maybe that kind of disagreement between these two camps of like, just go buy a video camera. Oh, just go buy a photography camera. I'm hopeful for the day where we have a true hybrid that does both really, really well in a way that kind of makes everybody happy. Because for as much as people say a perfect camera can't exist, and I think that is true to some extent, it does feel like we are getting ever closer to that mark, the better technology gets, to where we have kind of enough megapixels. Maybe we have enough resolution. Maybe the autofocus is getting good enough in video. We have stabilization now. We have the right size, dimensions, like hardware stuff sort of figured out for these cameras that work for both video and photo. So I see a lot of potential right on the horizon for where these things benefit each other directly, even though it doesn't always feel like it. It feels like go buy a cinema camera, that's what you need if you want to do video. But really, I think there is a lot of room to play with that hybrid system and, and make a camera that serves both audiences. It's not easy by any means, and there are considerations that each one may have separate from the other in terms of photographers versus videographers. But the more we work through that and you try and make something that appeals to both, I think ultimately the better product you end up making in the end. Kind of just uh, a, a talking segment there, but something that's been coming up because people have been, you know, every once in a while there'll be a comment of like, just go buy a video camera. And it's like, to me, it's kind of short-sighted. It's kind of like it doesn't see the bigger picture of like what these devices can become when they're really thoughtfully designed for both video and photo. And I think Canon was very, very close and they could have had it. Let's see. Um, I feel like people have forgotten about the misery before T5 SSDs moving one terabyte data from the camera to your computer used to be a huge headache. I don't miss mini DV tapes. I do not miss mini DV at all. Mini DV, so on the DVX100, not actually the first mini DV camera I shot with. That would have been the XL1, the Canon XL1, but the Panasonic DVX100. I recorded mini DV tapes, and this was when I was first starting off, and you'd have to log in transfer and final cut, at least that's how I did it, the whole tape deck system. Huge pain, because you had to wait real time, you know, for just watching the footage back. And if you had, you know, eight hours of tapes to go through, it's just a chore to sit there and start and stop every single time, but hey, it's what was done. And there's many people out there still doing that kind of stuff, you know, archiving home movies that people have on tape and they just gotta, gotta play it back and capture it. However, on the DVX100, I realized you can, it had Firewire on it. And so you could actually send signal directly from the DVX100 into Final Cut. You could just log and capture from the camera and bypass the mini DV tapes, that is. And the quality was so much better, of course, it was plugged in with like this cable and you're, you know, to a laptop. I think it's what it was. I think I had it to a laptop, but you could do a uh, firewire cable from the DVX 100 into a computer, log and capture that way. And the quality was so much better, even for standard def. And that's the thing. We're always limited by the compression. We're always like these cameras for the longest time have been able to do a lot better than what we've been able to get out of them because the recording format, the media wasn't really good, even with SD cards. When the GH1 first came out, you know, it's AVC HD, and I think at the beginning it was like 13 
uh, megabits per second or something like abysmal, abysmally low um, in terms of like compression and, and data rates, which makes the files smaller. But if you're losing valuable information, it's, that's not how you want to shoot. You want detail in your footage. So having something that is, you know, raw or close to raw or just really a quality compression, you know, uh, format is very valuable, even from back in the days of mini DV, because the mini DV like would just ruin how good that footage could look if you just took it straight off of the camera, you know, via Firewire. But everyone just recorded mini DV because that was easy, that was cheap, that was affordable. It's like put a DV tape in there that you don't want to have to hook up a computer to your camera every time you want to record. But if you want the best quality, you kind of have to sometimes. So that's the situation we're in currently, right, with HDMI. Thankfully, we have these external monitors that act as recorders that sit right atop the camera. It's not like you need a whole separate laptop or computer workstation to do it, but it still is slightly less efficient than just doing it all internally, which would be the best case scenario, I suppose. Let's see. Uh, I hate mini DV. Hi, all these formats are a nightmare. Yeah, the Blackmagic Design 12K in sensor downscaling binning is quite promising. Fast video readout without processor needing to do the binning. Then proper full-scale capture with fast readout becomes possible. Callus says, I hated FireWire. Glad that's gone. <laughs> well, FireWire, there was 400, 800. Was there anything else uh, above 800 FireWire? That tech uh, and more hybrid-oriented cameras would be great. I hate AVC HD. Yeah, horrid. Yeah, me too. Uh, the idea of pulling high quality stills from 4K video could be incredible. In some situations, would work well for shooting highlight video clips and stills all at once, especially at 120 frames per second. Yeah, so uh, 4K plus video. So that's the thing is like with, so you can do it. I don't know if uh, off the top of my head, I'm sure there's somebody who has a calculator built out there of like what the, the video K's, the video Ks mean in megapixels because that's always the difference, right? Like photography is almost always talked about in megapixels for how big or how much resolution you have, whereas video is never ever talked about in megapixels. It's always talked about in 4K, 8K, 12K, like the width uh, dimension in pixels. So then you multiply it by the height and then you sort of get your megapixel equivalent and then you can do vice versa if you know the dimensions of the image. With the megapixel count, if you know the the ratio of the image, you can figure out the K equivalent as well. But uh, yeah, it's almost always like the video side, what is it, um, 6K, is 6K close to 20 megapixels? I think it is, because if you had 6K, it's about 6,000, and then that's probably, what, 3,000 or 4,000 tall, so you're right around like 18, you know, 18 megapixels or 20 megapixels around there somewhere. So it's interesting, like how the numbers sometimes lie to you. Cause like 4k is what basically, is it either eight megapixels or 12 megapixels? I've seen both um, rated. And again, it, it really comes down to the aspect ratio. Cause depending on the height of your image that can really determine like how many megapixels there are in terms of uh, numbers. So if you have a two to one aspect ratio and you're shooting 4K, so roughly 4,000 pixels wide, that's 2,000 tall, two to one, very cinematic aspect ratio. That's only eight megapixels compared to, you know, 6K, which would be two to one, would be 6,000 by 3,000. Now you're at 18 megapixels. So the even going from 4K to 6K may not sound like a lot, but in terms of megapixels, it's significant. Um, so just something to keep in mind uh, talking about doing photo and video simultaneously. There is a point and we're close, closing in on it, you know, with 8K and 12K and these things where, you know, it's maybe not, I don't know, it, how big is 12K in megapixels? I don't actually know. We could do some math because uh, we're, just, we're just hanging out at this point. This is just a free for all now. We're going to do some math. So let's do uh, black uh, magic design. And let's go 12K. I don't know the actual dimensions of the footage. So let's find, let's find the Ursa Mini Pro 12K. What happened to the Ursa? Is there going to be an Ursa still, or is it only the Ursa Mini now? I mean, the Ursa Mini 
is definitely like the preferred body style I like. The Ursa is just massive um, with a giant screen too. Uh, oh, here we go. 12,288 by 6480. So let's do... On 288 by 6480. Do some math. That is roughly, what am I doing? What is that in megapixels? 79 megapixels? Is that accurate? Did I do my math right? 79 megapixels? Maybe I could have looked over in the chat and someone already had it up first. But um, yeah, 79 megapixels from you know 12K. So 6K, 8K, 12K you know, definitely in the uh, same range as your photography brethren there in terms of having an equivalent. But I don't know, it depends on your workflow. If you want all those extra frames and then just to pull one for a photo, maybe that makes sense. Maybe you only need the one photo and you don't need all this footage. So it's just a waste of hard drive space at that point. It's really depending, you know, like one photo, a lot more economical to film than, you know, filming 12K for 30 minutes and filling terabytes of uh, uh, hard drive space up just for one photo. But maybe it's worth it for the project. Uh, 4K is around 8 megapixels. Yep. Uh, UHD 4K is 8 megapixels. Each doubling of K multiplies your megapixels by 4, double in two dimensions. So... The um, each doubling of K multiplies your megapixels by four. So would you have to? So is it twelve times four for the twelve uh, K? I find it's the motion blur of shooting one fiftieth. I've turned clients down when they've asked for that. You'll need to be in faster frame rates, like you're saying. Absolutely. So yeah, if you're shooting, you know, one twenty frames per second, your shutter speed would probably be you know one over two forty. That may be fast enough to freeze some motion. Are you handheld? Is the subject moving? But also at those higher frame rates, you probably don't need motion blur as much. So it would really, you'd have to be smart about how you're capturing it. Because yeah, motion blur will ruin your, your photos every single time if you're trying to pull them from video. That's one of the big downfalls. Even if you have the resolution, if your shutter speed isn't high enough, you're gonna have motion blur and no one wants a blurry photo. 79 megapixels, 80 megapixels, it said on the Blackmagic page. Oh, it did? Did I miss it? Was it over on the Blackmagic page, 80 megapixels? Oh, it did. I didn't, well, we did the math to validate and 80 megapixels, it's actually 79.6 megapixels. I think I did the math right. 6480 by 12 to 12,288. So not quite 80 megapixels there. Should be a little asterisk black magic. I'm just joking. Of course, it's 80 megapixels. Uh, 4K to 6K uh, would increase megapixels by 1.5 times 1.5, 6 over 4 if the same dimensions. That, that, who's going to, is someone going to, you can do that math in your head? Someone needs to make a little app or something. You'll need amazing glass for a 12K camera. I wonder if there will ever be a way to simultaneously dual record at either two different shutter speeds or two different frame sizes. Was it Red was doing that, weren't they? With the um, HDR mode, it's technically two different shutter speeds, isn't it? I don't know if they, do they still do the HDR stuff on the Red cameras? That was big news uh, a while ago, years and years ago at this point. I assume they still have HDR, it was a HDR X is what they branded it, but I'm pretty sure that was done with, um, yeah, reading of the sensor, basically your shutter shutter speed, like two different readings. So theoretically it's possible. 4K to 12K ought to be eight megapixels times 12 over four raised or uh, squared then, oh my goodness. Well, we know, we know now it's 80 megapixels. <laughs> I would just make a make a little app, you know, convert convert uh, your photo conversion, video photo converter. Um, yeah, I think the 12K looks awesome just for, which is interesting that they fit so much on a Super 35 size sensor. But it's cool uh, for the frame rates, uh, being able to do not just 12K, but being able to do 8K or um, 6K or 4K at really, really high frame rates, I think is fantastic compared to the Ursa Mini 
uh, G2, you max out at 120 and uh, at, at maximum resolution. So here we go, full resolution at higher frame rates. 12K 60, they didn't even, they, like this is why I love Black Magic. They didn't opt for 12K 24, no, no, no. They went all out, 12K 60, 8K 110, 4K 220, that's, that's a lot. Let's see, here we go, full 12K sensor at 24 frames per second, constant bit rate, uncompressed, Oh, I see. Oh, mega. Oh, 18 to 1. Oh, they added 18 to 1 as a compression ratio now. Eh? Ooh, interesting. Constant quality. Q5, Q3, Q1. Nice. Yeah, the Ursa Mini Pro 4.68 G2 and the Ursa Mini Pro 12K. Love the cameras. If you've never used an Ursa Mini, I highly recommend it. They're fantastic uh, to shoot with. They just they handle great. Footage looks fantastic. They're a joy to work with. And built-in NDs, which is pretty common nowadays on these types of cameras, but it is nice to have. Yeah, I think these look really cool. Hey, Strawn, side topic. What sparked your passion for video? How long have you been into it? Oh, my goodness. That is, that's a long, lengthy question to answer. Um, what sparked my passion for video? I will give the cliched answer of like, I've always done video, like from as a kid, home videos. My dad had a camcorder. I would play with Legos and action figures and make home movies, like little stories with action figures as a kid. I know that's like every filmmaker, whoever does that kind of stuff. And then when I was 12, I started volunteering at a church doing live video production. So imagine, you know, live um, IMAG style projector screens, you know, live stage presentation type stuff. And I started volunteering because that's, you know, it wasn't like paid or anything. It's for a church, uh, but they wanted to start doing live video. That was kind of at the time, bigger churches were doing that sort of thing, as well as a lot of different venues, because it was around that time where things like the XL1 and the DVX100 were making it a little bit more affordable than it had been prior to that where you needed the really, really big expensive broadcast cameras. Now it's like everyone does video, right? Every place you go, whether it's a school, a church, a museum, everyone does video because it's, it's so easy uh, to do and so cheap, relatively speaking. So I started doing that when I was 12 as a volunteer. And from there, it just turned into like every, every which way doing like something, just helping out. Uh, I found that I enjoyed it. I liked it and I wanted to do more of it. So like sometimes that'd be like little short film things, little like comedy sketch type things. Eventually uh, YouTube became a thing. And so I had a channel, I don't think it exists anymore, but you know, I do like little comedy sketch type stuff uh, with my friends and we'd upload that and what would I shoot that on? That was around the same time, like shooting similar type of stuff. So a little bit later, so I was probably 16, 17 around that time. Uh, eventually, graduating high school, going to college, it's like, okay, what, what do you wanna do with your life? What career do you wanna pick? And over those six years, I had really found doing video work I really enjoyed. Along the way, it turned into like paid gigs here or there, right? I'm still a high school student, so it was like a random weekend. There was some event, you know, to film and, and get paid for. But I really enjoyed the work. I got into editing at that same time. So when I was talking about capturing mini DV tapes and all that workflow. That was all at that time, figuring out editing, learning Final Cut uh, 7. So found I really liked it. I enjoyed it and thought, hey, I could go to college and do a film program somewhere and do that sort of education, uh, four years of college, get a film degree. Went and did that and kept working along the way, doing little things here or there. And then finally, after that, went and got hired and then it's been you know career ever since, um, doing different jobs, working at different places over the years. But I would say in why I got into video specifically, as opposed to like photography or anything else creative, like painting or writing or anything like that. I've always just been fascinated by movies, of course, as most people are, but then also like the creation of them. I've always been fascinated by the behind the scenes, like what camera they're using, how they got a certain shot, some of like the special effects type stuff, uh, really interesting. And so in college, I ended up kind of 
teaching myself After Effects via Andrew Kramer over at Video Copilot. Of course, it's like the best way to learn After Effects. Um, and so I've just kind of like I built up my skills over the years doing little things here or there. And being in Arizona, we aren't known for like one industry or one type of production. It is really every, every which way from corporate, from wedding, from music videos to sometimes Hollywood productions will make their way over this way. Sometimes TV shows will be filmed here, but it's not like often. So it's not like, there's not like a staple industry that's just like Arizona's no, Arizona is known for this type of thing. Like you have in maybe, you know, Hollywood or Atlanta now or New York or, um, uh, even like Seattle, I suppose. Uh, so it's just evolved over the years and people will say like, Oh, how did you, people always, always when they ask other people like, well, how did you get to where you are now? It's a very like crooked path. And like in, in hindsight, like it all makes sense the way it all worked out, but it is just like one path. That was like the path I took. It's not like it, it you have to do it that way or there's any, any right way or any wrong way. It's just the choices I made along the way saying yes usually to things of like uh, back when I was first starting, it was like working for free and just getting the experience. And then it was, you know, charging, but like charging a little bit. So I'm just making a little bit of money uh, here or there. And then just growing over time, building out your kit, uh, getting better at stuff, right? When I first started out, there's, um, you know, not th that, not that I'm way better now or anything, but just like your skills obviously evolve over time and you learn more and you understand things a little bit better. And then you're always learning and growing on that on that curve and that experience learning from other people. Now that we have a fantastic resource like YouTube, it's really easy to learn pretty much anything you would want. So my thing that I've always been driven towards is video and I, I don't know, I think it's because of all the pieces. It's Photography is really interesting to me in that you can capture one image and yes, you can tell a story with that one image, but there's so many other layers to video. Not only is it pictures that move, which is already something very different than photography, but you also have audio with it, which is a whole other layer of experience. That, like there's, you don't have audio for a photo. You don't have moving photos like that. Then that becomes video. And so that whole experience, the idea of like a crew and all these different roles that people play and all the, the technicalities of each specific, you know, person and what they're, what they do and what they're able to do, I think is so fascinating. And then layered on top of that with like motion graphics or special effects, and then, you know, actors and directors and, and all the things that go into production, I think are, are so interesting. And a lot of it is problem solving. I've always enjoyed puzzles and figuring things out and you'll go onto a shoot and you'll go into a space and you don't know how you're going to make it work. And it's problem solving. You got to figure it out kind of on the fly because it rained when it was supposed to be sunny that day or, you know, the location got canceled. So now you have to find a backup spot. Like there's always problem solving. And I find that very satisfying as well. So there's a lot of reasons that I got into it. I can't point to like one thing other than just the opportunities presented themselves. And then I just said yes, because it seemed like what I wanted to be doing and more than it was like just fun but I actively enjoyed learning and researching about it, which is something that does separate it from like things that are just fun to do. Like I enjoy snowboarding. I enjoy, um, you know, riding a bike. I enjoy, uh, going fast in a car, but like, I'm not a car person. I'm not a biking person. I'm not a snowboarder. Like they're just fun things to do versus, video and cameras, you know, specifically have always grabbed me in a way where I want to learn more about them. I find them fun. I don't think really like my work, my work doesn't really usually feel like work because I enjoy doing it, but I also enjoy doing all the other things around it, researching and learning to make it, make the, the career better. And I think that that is a struggle. Some people find they get into photography or they get into video because they think it's fun and it is fun, but then they don't have that passion for improvement via learning, watching tutorials, um, some of the boring stuff, you know, quite frankly, of like understanding, like lighting in general, I feel like is one that people really struggle with right off the bat of like good lighting versus bad lighting and where to put the lights and what to do and what not to do. It's a big hurdle to overcome. And a lot of people don't like that pressure. They just want to go in with a camera and just shoot something you know, fingers crossed, it looks good. 
rather than understanding all the other complexity around it. And same thing is true for photographers in that matter, right? People just want to take pictures and then they're like, why doesn't it look good? I bought a really expensive camera with a really good lens. Why doesn't it look good? And it's like, well, your lighting's all wrong. So there's some other layers that are less fun and maybe not why you get into the thing you get into that if you can find the appreciation for learning almost anything related to the your, your subject or your, your field of study, learning the stuff that's related or tangential and that's still bringing you joy and energy to lift up your main your main passion, I think that's how you know you're on like the right track where if you don't really have that, it'll probably be more of a struggle and it'll be harder to get better faster because you just, I always say, you know, people will do what they want to do. You know, like a lot of people say, well, I want to, I want to learn how to like code. I want to be a, a computer programmer. I want to make games or I want to make apps or, you know, I want to uh, go to the gym. I want to go to the gym more often. It's like, well, if you wanted to do it, you would just do it. If you wanted to learn how to code and be a game developer, you would just already be doing it. You wouldn't have to like wish it into existence. The very nature of you just kind of saying these things makes it almost untrue because now you're just wishing and wishing you were a different type of person rather than the per person who's already pursuing it, already doing it. So I think that's really something good to know about yourself when you say those things of like, oh man, I really wish I was going to the gym more often. I, I want to go to the gym. I want to get back into going to the gym. If you really, really wanted to, you would already be doing it. So there's something there that's blocking you from doing it and then figuring out why that is can help you actually overcome that hurdle um, because maybe it's something that you're not really considering and you're just by saying it, you feel like you're kind of validating it. Like, oh, I want to be a cinematographer. It's like, what do you, do you shoot videos every day? Do you look, look up things? Do you research movies? Do you break down, you know, lighting diagrams and that kind of stuff? Well, no, but I really want to be a cinematographer. Well, if you want to be that, then like you would be doing things to get there and you wouldn't even have to say you want to do it because you'd already be actively pursuing it. So what else is it? Is it just a, a nice idea that like sounds cool and you don't actually want it? Or do you really want it and something's holding you back? I think all that stuff is very good to evaluate and understand. I'll pop back in the chat here. See that you got the streaming outfit. Awesome. Yes, David. It's the, uh, the official uniform of the, the stream here. I just need to, we, we, we were talking about, we need some logo or something. We need to figure it out. I've heard 35 millimeter film is roughly the resolution of 12K. Interesting, Steve. I think, who is it? Red was back in the day saying 4K was the resolution of 35 millimeter film. I, I don't know. I feel like that's always a thing. Like people say the red, like, oh, but maybe it's like what the human eye can perceive versus the true resolution. I don't know enough about the technical stuff of, of film to know what the resolution equivalent is, but I'm sure 12K is awesome regardless. Remember when it was just 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter film and digi beta tape? Just shoot and edit. Those were the days. <laughs> uh, I've never shot 35 millimeter film. I've never shot 16 millimeter film and I've never shot digi beta tape. I started with mini DV and it's been digital ever since. So I don't quite relate, but I, you know, I can, I, I like the simplicity but you have different like uh, film stocks, don't you, right? It's not just 35 millimeter film. It's like, uh, they're, and they're special, like, you know, the way the film is made that makes it slightly different, right? Your ASA ratings, but then also like how it's processed and the chemical bath and the treatment for your, your color grade and all that stuff. Film sounds like a whole, whole nother thing that I would have loved to have done had it been relevant to me in the time and place I was at, but it, I've just, I've never crossed paths with any opportunity to do anything with film. And I've also just never gone out of my way to do it. Cause I really like the digital workflow of just like copying cards to a hard drive and going from there uh, in kind of like a non-destructive way. But I really do uh, appreciate the insight from people who shot film. Have you checked out the Kinefinity cameras? Yes, I have. I have looked at the Kinefinity cameras. They seem great. I haven't actually used them myself. And from what it looks like, like the menus and the interface and just like the handling isn't quite as like polished and perfected as I would want. Uh, I'm sure they're great cameras and they do an excellent job, but I really, I think steer more towards the black magic stuff. Cause I, f I feel like for a similar price point, you get maybe a more well-refined product, even though you might get technically better specs 
in terms of like uh, sensor size out of the Kinefinity stuff. So I don't know, but it is it is like it's right at that threshold where it is still a lot to pay for a camera and a brand that I don't immediately trust uh, right away just because like it seems like they're still figuring some of that out. Like, like it's still rough around the edges and they still have some polishing to do. 35 millimeter film at high ISO couldn't possibly be comparable in sharpness to modern cameras, but film handled gray, uh, to handle dynamic range great and noise behavior at high ISO was more beautiful than digital noise, noise reduction. Yeah, I mean, film, it's like a physical thing. So you have like substance, there's like a, a thing there that you're capturing rather than it just being a digital signal. So there's always going to be like inherent differences, but I think we're well past the point of it being better. You know, most photographers are using digital cameras and there are some still shooting film. I know a few actually who do it just for fun for like weddings. They'll have a film camera and they'll take some shots and then they'll develop the film. But for the most part, they're developing if they like the film look, they make their digital images look the same. So it's like, you can kind of do both. And I feel like we're kind of there with video as well. It's like, if you like film grain, like you can do that, you can add it. If you, you know, you want the high dynamic range, like we're, we're there, we're pretty close anyway, for most, um, for most people, most viewers don't notice a difference. So the only thing that digital has ever had against it is that it's like too clean, it's too sterile, it's too sharp and precise, but you can always muddy it up. Like you can put filters on there, you can add film grain, you can do whatever you want to kind of roughen it up a little bit if that's the, the look you want. Let's see. Um, I've only shot 35 millimeter stills though, never experimented with film motion cameras. Oh yeah. I have, I have not shot any film whatsoever other than what was in those Kodak, you know, the yellow Kodak disposable cameras. Like there's film, there was film in there, um, but that's not, you know, 35 millimeter film or 16 millimeter. I don't know what, what size film is in there, but like those little, you know, basically the point and shoot, but for disposable, the disposable Kodak cameras, that's the only film I've ever shot. I think I do have a film camera somewhere around though, or maybe I might not. I don't know what happened to it. I went to school for computing and for my final project, I decided to create a digital camera. A big international company saw my work and hired me out of school. It's good to hear everyone's stories. That's so Callus, it, I think that's how you say it. Callus has been in here every once in a while and, uh, drop some interesting, uh, bits of, of knowledge. I'll take his word for it. Sounds like a cool guy. I documented geocaching with my friends, hence my channel name. Now it's just random culture, music events, and trying, playing with vintage lenses, anamorphics, etc. Oh, that's awesome. So do you put stuff on your YouTube channel as well? Random geocacher about anamorphics? Uh, can I, if I click this, I, don't, I can't pop over to a channel, but I can search for it on YouTube. So... Um, let's see. Uh, I love every step from setting up camera, framing, shooting, color correcting, editing, and probably this might sound weird, but the least favorite is watching the final video. Well, I mean, a lot of times by the time you're done with the final video, if you've shot, you've edited it, you've watched it plenty of times beforehand. So I still enjoy watching a final piece, especially once I'm removed from it far enough in time that We've got like, you know, you do the initial shoot, you do the edit, you watch it, you know, 200 times over, you finish it up, you put it out there, you do one final check to make sure that there's no issues with it, it's perfect, there's no glitches or errors, and then you can, whew, I'm done. When you come back six months later, I'm almost always really like pleasantly surprised and like proud of myself of like, wow, like that. Yeah, that was awesome. Like I did that. I made that. It's something new that was put onto the universe that didn't exist beforehand. And I think that feeling is always good. But it's always like six months later that it comes. There's definitely like a six month window where you're like, I don't want to see anything to do with that project because I'm done. I'm over it. I'm on to the next thing. And then it's always, you know, reminiscing and looking back and thinking about the shoot and thinking about the edit and all the hours you put in and all the late nights. And you go, Yeah, that was worth it. That was awesome. I I did a pretty good job, me. And you pat yourself on the back. Like that's a good feeling. And that's, that's when I always find the most enjoyment of watching anything I've done 
is when I'm far, far, you know, away from it into the future and looking back thinking, I'm glad I did that. Uh, what's a dream project or story you'd love to tell through video one day? Imagine there's no budget limitations. Well, Kelvin, I don't know that I have a dream project other than I just really enjoy telling good stories, interesting stories, and capturing them in the best way possible, but also in a way that is very economical. And I like doing it for that reason because it's very easy if you are on YouTube these days or you're anywhere on the internet, it's very easy to get caught up in the constant need to buy, 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 buy things. Buy, oh, you need this camera, you need this lens, you need this rig, you need this, 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 and this. Don't get me wrong, I do the exact same thing. I enjoy buying new equipment because it's fun. You know, new lights, new cameras, etc. But that always comes to with, you know, the bigger some of these channels get, the more expensive stuff they talk about. And it goes from talking about cheap little throw, I'm trying to find like, okay. So we talked about this before, this Mikey lens, right? And this anamorphic. This is in maybe not anymore the cheapest way to shoot anamorphic. But at the time I bought the SLR Magic Anamorphite because it was incredibly cheap for what it did. And this taking lens also a hundred bucks, incredibly cheap for what it is, a 35 millimeter micro four third lens. So this combination is purely designed for, you know, budgetary concerns. This is not the best anamorphic lens. That would be far more expensive. Although it's not the worst anamorphic lens either, because that would probably be a waste and not very much value. So I like finding those things that are really affordable that anyone more or less could theoretically, if they were interested in it, at least play around with it, experiment, and make something that wasn't total trash, but the expectation isn't there that you have to spend, you know, 20 grand on one lens, or you have to spend, you know, a thousand dollars a day renting a set. You can do it, you know, a thousand dollars can get you like a functional thing that you can use as much as you want just by buying it. Same reason I'm such a fan of the GH5 or even the Blackmagic pocket cameras, or even the Ursa Mini for that fact, in that for what it does, it at the time was so affordable, you know? And that, again, we talked about this earlier, cameras always get cheaper over time, so you lose that as time goes on, because things just keep getting better. But I like doing projects that tell the compelling story, do it in a beautiful way, but also show behind the scenes that you don't need the most expensive million dollar budget. You don't need the fanciest red camera. You don't need all this, like you don't need cinema lenses. You know, you don't need some of this stuff to make good stories. Cause I think far too often that's what ends up happening is people get distracted by the gear or the tech and they lose sight of the content itself. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Content is king. You can capture it however you want, do it the best you can, but people care about the content. So I like showing that you can do some of this like high-end premium work with relatively affordable uh, equipment to hopefully motivate people of any, you know, any budget, right? We talked about earlier, like cheap cinema cameras, like you can go buy, you know, a red one secondhand for like 1800 bucks. You can have access to these like premium tools or even cheap tools. If you can't afford 1800 bucks, you can afford the $500 camera or the $300 camera or the $200 camera or the free camera that your you know relative gave to you because they don't use it anymore. You can make amazing content with anything and that's kind of what I like to show. It's one thing to go see a film that has a $100 million budget and go, wow, that looks great. It's another thing to see something, and the example I like to use often is Primer, the movie Primer, if you've never seen it. The, well, that's that's paint primer. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, primer, the movie. If you've never seen, oh, the full movie is on YouTube, apparently. Well, <laughs> there you go. So uh, you can see it on YouTube. Um, there's a trailer here. Primer is a really good film, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like indie film. It's very, very low budget. Uh, I think the budget would, they say it was like $7,000. Um, Shane Carruth, the, uh, director went on to do another film called Upstream Color shot on the GH2 actually. 
years ago. Upstream color. I don't like the film as much as I like primer, but it's still interesting to watch um, for the fact that it was shot on a GH2. So the fact that like this stuff is doable on a GH2, you know, like that to me is what is more rewarding, I think, than having the coolest, latest and greatest stuff that like, okay, yeah, like you made something look amazing with the most expensive budget imaginable. Well, can you do it with like 500 bucks? I like that challenge. I like showing that it can be done and that sometimes it can't be done. Sometimes you need to spend money because you just, it costs what it costs. So finding those boundaries, I think is really satisfying. Sorry, that doesn't really answer the question of like, what's my passion project? I don't have one other than just continuing to make good content. Let's see. Editing the initial cut, getting all the early cuts laid out is what I like least. Getting two hours of a very good footage down to two to 10 minutes. Cut of great footage is horribly time consuming. Yeah, editing editing takes takes a toll. It takes time. That mentality that you espoused and the accessibility for everyone along the continuum is why I got into your videos and subscribed to your channel. Well, thank you, RM. Uh, waking up to these morning live streams is nice. If it's morning for you, uh, that's excellent. It's I'm about to go to sleep because it's getting late. But uh, yeah, hopefully I, I you know if, if there's a better time that I can do these live streams, let me know. I'm sure everyone has their preference of like what time works best for them. With time zones, it kind of is what it is. I just kind of do them when it's most convenient for me. So I do apologize if that's not ideal for you. Primer was a great time travel flick. Really fun and exciting all the way. Yeah, and Primer definitely has its quirks. It's not a perfect film by any means. It's not even, you know, a great film, but it's probably one of my favorite films because of what they did. If we, we can read about it a little bit if you want. It has a Wikipedia page. So Primer is a 2004 American science fiction film about the accidental discovery of time travel. If that doesn't spark your interest already, like just go watch it. It's probably the best time travel film I've ever seen. And it's an indie film. So that alone should set it apart. But also, Primer is of note for its extremely low budget, experimental plot structure, philosophical implications, and complex technical dialogue, which Caruth, a college graduate with a degree in mathematics and a former engineer, chose not to simplify for the sake of the audience. The film collected the Grand Jury Prize at the 2004 Sundance Film Festival before securing a limited release in the United States and has since gained a cult following. It should have more of a following. It's a fantastic film. Yeah, see here, budget, $7,000. Uh, at the box office, it made almost a million. I don't know what kind of release it got, but I do highly recommend watching it um, and not spoiling yourself. Like, you could watch the trailer. That's probably fine. It'll get you excited for it. But don't read anything about it, of course, because the best part of Primer is just watching it, and you will go like, what? But it carries you along, and then the best thing about Primer is by the time you get to the end, You'll almost, I, I, you'll probably want to watch it again. Um, it's one of those kind of films, uh, which I always find really, really fun. Again, not perfect. It's not like a masterpiece of like technical excellence, but it's really, really good for what it is. And knowing that it's so low budget and what it took to get it done, I think makes it even more impressive. And what, and and it is genuinely good. You know, don't get me wrong. It's not like it's bad, but oh, it had a low budget, so I'll forgive it. No, it's a really good film. It just has some rough spots that don't quite make sense uh, from a scripting standpoint, like story standpoint, it's kind of hard to follow. And then there's a there's there's one scene in particular that has like the worst sound and the worst lighting. Uh, it's nighttime near a fountain and it's just like, it's so hard to tell what's happening. Aside from that, the rest of the film is beautiful. Um, and I'll say beautiful because like it's indie, but it's just so well done. Uh, they shot it on film if I recall correctly, but then yeah, Upstream Color, the kind of, it's not a sequel uh, by any means, but it's just like an, the next film that Shane Carruth did. Uh, I don't know what he's been up to lately. That'd be interesting. We'll see what uh, what he's working on. If anything, I think he said in interviews that doing Primer basically sucked all the motivation and like uh, love for film out of him. Uh, but he did end up doing Upstream Color 
And it's a much more like artistic, abstract film, but it's worth watching as well. Let's see, does it say on here if the GH2, they don't have GH2 in the Wikipedia. Oh, come on. All right, let's find it. Make sure I'm not just making things up. We gotta prove that it was, uh, yeah. So let's see. Uh, the cinema release of this movie deserves its own thread. It's no longer merely a Sundance entry or a good point earned at a as an SLR camera's entry into feature films, but finally we have a film getting real reviews by film reviewers. Hardly any critic uses the word indie or refers to the look of a hack GH2. They go on a journey. Like Shane Cruz's film or not, they're talking about it in film terms, the story, the actors. This, folks, is a coming of age for a little baby, the hack GH2. So... Upstream color, shot on a hack GH2, and again, it's not about, like the camera just helps you tell the story. Is the story itself good? Uh, so Panasonic GH2, Carruth's film. What's he up to now? Let's go see. Uh, what's he got? Primer, upstream color, unrealized, or upcoming work. Yeah, so it's just the two films, which is unfortunate because I think he's very uh, talented filmmaker and would love to see more let's see the film was released on vhx uh, music from was featured in a documentary tickled unrealized our upcoming work so it looks like everything else is just kind of either in the works or not coming or canceled or whatever which is a shame really fun it was so well written uh, I'll check it out. Sounds awesome. Sometimes the best ideas come from limitations, confinement to get creative within. That is true. Restrictions often breed the best creativity. If you're just given an open sandbox playground of infinite budget, you can do anything you want. Usually that's where the worst ideas come from. When you're given a restriction of you only have one day or you only have one week or you only have this one location or you only have this one thing or this certain set of circumstances, it has to be done by this date. That I think is where the real creative juices start flowing because then you're stretching that problem solving skill set to, okay, well, how can we meet those accommodations but do it in the best way possible? And that is a really fun exercise. And you do come up with very creative solutions doing that. If you have infinite budget and you can just, and you have as much time in the world and you can just do whatever you want, like, you get usually kind of bore, boring, bland stuff that's just kind of heartless, kind of soulless. It doesn't really add all that much value. I like the restrictions because it makes me, it pushes me to be more creative and think outside the box and try new things that I may not have even considered before. At least if you have restrictions, you have a starting point. That's also true. I almost always start with the restrictions. I say, what is the budget? And what's the deadline? Any project, client project, whatever. And that, if and, and you know, usually it's like, well, the budget we want it, you know, we want it as low as possible. And it's like, okay, yeah, but like, what's the budget? Because like, you there has to be a number. You can't just, I mean, unless you're literally saying it's zero, in which case that may be like a no go, and we just say, nope, not can't do it. Or if it's literally zero, then it's like, all right, well, it's only going to be, you know, these certain things. Um, and then, yeah, deadline is also really, really important. Uh, I'm sure you all know it, but it's always a good reminder. You Fast, cheap, good, pick two. You can't have all three. So fast, cheap, or good, pick two. Do you want it fast and cheap? It's not going to be good. Do you want it good and fast? It's not going to be cheap. And do you want it good and cheap? Well, it's not going to be fast. So that's how it always plays out. So if you just, you almost always know you're going to try and make something good. So that's off of there. So then it's always the question about how much is it going to cost? What's the budget? Because is it supposed to be cheap or, wh or what are we working with here? And then is it supposed to be fast? Because almost always people want it fast and cheap, and but they don't want to sacrifice it being good. They want it to be good. So which one? Is it going to be slow or is it going to be expensive? That's typically where you end up falling with those things. Fast, cheap, or good. Pick two. It's very, very true in more than just, you know, creative industries. But it's just kind of across the board. You just can't, you usually just can't have all three. 
Uh, you can try as best you can, and that's almost what always everyone wants, but usually something will be sacrificed along the way. I've seen filmmakers sell their soul to make these films. It's very sad, but I can understand why they get burnt out and no longer want to continue making more films. That's also why I love my pocket setup. It's hard, but super rewarding. Is it the pocket cinema? Is it the, or you were talking earlier, Mikhail, you were, there was the original pocket camera. Glad you know the triangle. Yes, I do know the triangle. Uh, pick two. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a, one of those cliches that's valuable for a reason because it is so true and it's helpful. I like to use the analogy whenever I'm talking about budgets with people who aren't familiar with video because people like to ask, and this is, I, maybe this should be its own video. Maybe it's a bonus fourth video. All right. I'm going to set this down again. People always say, how much does a video cost? And the answer is, it depends. And that's really annoying to have to tell anyone because when people say, how much does a video cost? They always want a clear number, $500, $1,000, $10,000, $50,000. I don't know, it depends. What people are really asking usually when they say, how much does a video cost? They're trying to get an estimate of like what your services you know, cost and what they can expect to be paying you. But that's not a really good place to start. A better question almost always is something other than how much does a video cost? Because the answer is always, it depends. So if someone's asking you this question and they're saying, how much does video cost? Or how much does photo, how much does photography cost? How much does whatever cost? If you have wedding packages or you have, you know, some pre-planned things that can just be easily sold as a service, weddings come to mind or event coverage, that's pretty straightforward. But many, many times there are so many nuanced variables in any type of production, whether it's photo or video, that there's the, the budget can go up or down based on those variables. So what I always like to talk to people about is, well, how much does a house cost? If you ask someone that, everyone knows what a house costs. It depends. You could also say, how much does a car cost? It depends. Put it in a context for what they can understand because p typically when people are asking like how much does a video cost, they think you have like one thing you provide, like you do it a certain way, but guaranteed the way they're envisioning it in their head is probably not anything you would envision right off the bat. So getting to that point of like, well, what kind of features do you want? What specifications do you want in this video is very, very valuable, just like a house or a car or anything else that has a variety of options at all different price points. For cars, you have low-end models that are really cheap and economical, and they get you from point A to point B, but there's nothing fancy about them. On the high end, you might have things, you know, like Teslas that are not super, super high end, but they're expensive and they come with nice features that some people really find valuable. So they're willing to pay for those features. For a home, it might be a shack, you know, that's like, but it's on the most valuable piece of property there is. And in another case, it could be a mansion, but maybe it's old and decayed. And so it's not really worth much anymore. And it's on land that no one wants. Of course, there's everything in between. There's small homes, you know, three bedroom, four bedroom. Is there a two story? How many? What's the square footage? Are there? Is there a pool in the backyard? What are all the things, the the features of this house? When was it built? Is it new? Is it old? This can help steer those conversations into kind of a meaningful place, so you can start talking about what the expectation is for the project before you talk about like how much it's gonna cost because there's no easy way to answer how much a video costs right off the bat. You can say, well, it's not cheap, <laughs> but that's not a good answer either. Um, so, and saying it depends is really frustrating for most people. So I really like to have the conversation like, well, okay, are we talking about like, is it a one day shoot? And they say, I don't know, how much can you film in a day? Well, like what kinds of things are we doing? Are we doing interviews? Are we doing B-roll? Like what's, what's the nature of what you want captured? How many locations? Is this something that's filmed in one spot in one day? Or is this a series of shoots across different states in different locations? Very, very different scope of work there. Is there any animation required? Is there, how long is the video gonna be? That's a big one. Is this a 15 second social video? Or is this a 15 minute explainer video? Is it a 15 hour lecture series? 
all of these variables add up to the cost of something. And it's really helpful to have those conversations with probably the client who's asking you beforehand to kind of gauge what their expectations are. And if they have a set budget, you can definitely find where their budget aligns with certain things. And you can, if it needs to be a long video, well, that's probably going to be more expensive. So maybe you take other things out, like it won't be multi-camera or it won't be as significant in editing, or maybe it's a short video. And so you can do more of that multicam and like really high end editing if their budget, you know, were to be the same if you compared apples to apples. So I always like to have that question, you know, back at the person, well, how much does a house cost or how much does a car cost? Because it almost always makes it much more relatable and they can start to understand, oh, yeah, I am buying a product. It's not just a service of like you just doing something. There's a, a physical thing that's created that has different components, just like different cars have different engines and different homes have different amounts of bathrooms. There's variety for the whole spectrum of, of price points and video production and photography falls into the same category. There's different ways to approach it and you can do really good stuff that's really cheap and you can do really good stuff that's really expensive. It just really comes down to the desire of the client and usually having that conversation just up front is a helpful way to get to that answer that they're looking for. I think I've done a similar video in the past, but it's always good to revisit. How much does life cost? <laughs> Let's see. Um, how much does a video cost? Everything. Damn, uh, dude, you go live late. Yeah, it's um, it's just the only time in the day. I it's right now it's eleven o'clock for me, eleven ten to be exact in Arizona. So I usually start these at nine p.m. Arizona time because uh, that works best for me. But I know it is not ideal for everybody else. In fact, we had a similar little moment uh, talking about that earlier. Um, having bad times, guys. Good to see you though. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, Sorry to hear that. Ask them how much does your life cost? What does this project mean to you? Yeah, I uh, don't want to bring my bad stuff into Strong's live stream. Oh, it's all good, Bart. Uh, I thought the house was speeding along. You were doing cabling and everything. Uh, oh, dog cancer. That's all I'm gonna say. Oh, that's a that's a really really sad to hear. I'm sorry. Um, let's listen to Strong's. Well, I'm almost done, but I'm happy to keep hanging out with all y'all for a little bit longer. If it's, uh, if it's fun, if there's anything else we should talk about, any other topics you want to throw my way, questions, uh, I I've gotten through everything I had planned to talk about. Um, we've gone even off on tangents talking about primer, which is a really good tangent to go off on. Primer is a really fantastic film. So I do highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, just for just for the fact of like, this is what you can, this is what independent cinema can be, you know, like it's possible to make something really, really good with no budget. And it's a lot of, in this, in Primer's case, it's about the writing. The writing is just so, so well done. There's nothing more expensive than free callus. So the free idea, I don't. So free, I've said, you know, should you work? For, I think that there's definitely a certain type of person who should work for free to get their foot in the door when they're first starting out. If you're already well on your way into your career, it's very, very hard to justify working for free unless you just want to do it. Um, in which case, like, yeah, absolutely. If you want to do it for free, then fine, do it. But if someone's asking you to do something for free off of like, well, it'll work out in the end, it'll be good in the long run, yada. I almost always would say like, have them pay you something. If they're not willing to pay you anything, then I, I don't know that I really trust that person. I'm trying to think if I've ever asked someone to like legitimately work for free. And I don't think I ever have. Um, if, if I wasn't doing it myself, there might be times where I've worked for free and they're like, and we've worked together for free as like a fun, a fun thing, like a fun, uh, shoot. But you know, I don't think I've ever been making money and then ask someone else to like work with me, but ask them to do it for free for, you know, experience or their portfolio or any of that kind of stuff. I feel like that's kind of a, a weaselly way to get, to just use people and abuse them. Although there are times where like when you're first starting out, like let's say the example I would use is uh, a friend is getting married 
and they have a, a wedding photographer that they've hired and, you, and you're just starting out and you want to get into video and you have nothing in your demo reel, you have nothing in your portfolio and they're not going to hire a video person anyway, I think that is an opportunity to do work for free and give them a wedding video that also benefits you because it can potentially lead to more work for you. And for them, they're not going to be disappointed by the outcome because they weren't going to buy it anyway. That's a very specific scenario, but there are other scenarios like that. A friend is in a band and they want to do a music video, um, or maybe they just made an album and they don't have the budget to do a music video and you want to get into doing music videos. Like, I would definitely say, shoot what you want to be doing. That's really important. Don't think you're going to go do like weddings and then like end up doing music videos or vice versa. If you want to shoot weddings, shoot weddings. If you want to shoot music videos, like if you want to make it your career, shoot what you want to shoot. If you want to be, you know, making feature films, shoot film narrative type stuff. If you want to be working in documentaries, make documentaries. You have to make what you want to be doing because it's very rare that you're going to be doing one type of work and then that's going to bounce you into another kind. It can happen, but I think it's far more likely you're setting yourself up for more success if you do what you want to do. So in the wedding example or the music video example, if it's for a friend and they weren't going to do it anyway and they're fine, they're not really ex expecting anything, it's not a client situation where that is where free can be very expensive. If you have a client who's expecting something to be done for free, because then it will just suck your time, you know, revisions and changes because it's not what they want. They're going to do this, this, and this, and the whole time you're not making any money, that's awful. However, I do think there are times where working for free can be beneficial when you're first starting out and you're trying to build up, you know, you have no, if you have nothing to show and you've never done a wedding before, why would someone pay you to do a wedding? That's a big risk and a gamble that they're taking. Whereas if you have one example of, hey, I filmed this wedding, I could do the same thing for your wedding and it will cost you. Now you have kind of a proof of concept, evidence that you can do what you say it is you're doing. And then when you say, oh yeah, and it's only 500 bucks, I don't know. Oh, it's only a thousand dollars, whatever it costs on the low end. That person can look and say, oh yeah, that's like totally worth it. I'm ha I'll happily pay you because I see the quality of what you can do. Same thing for the music video example. And then it's just like the stair step up. So the moment you start making money on the work, then you do do as best you can. This is the most important thing. Whether you're working for free or you're making money, do the best you can at that price point. So if it's free, if someone pay, you know, paid you nothing, make it look like they paid you something so that it's a good example to take to the next person and say, hey, I made this. It costs you know, $1,000. And then they say, great, here's $1,000. Now they give you $1,000. Take that $1,000 and make it look like $2,000. Make it look like $5,000. And then the next person, yeah, I can make this. And you say it's cost $5,000. And then they go, yeah, it does. It looks it looks like it costs $5,000. Here you go, $5,000. And then make that $5,000 look like $10,000, right? So you're constantly stair-stepping your way up the, the ladder based on punching above your weight class. Whatever someone is paying you, deliver something better because just for your own sake, now you have something that looks like it costs more the next go around. This has nothing to do with the amount of money you spend on it a lot of it is just in like the execution and like the feeling of the content. Does it feel premium? Is it well lit? Is the color grade good? Are things in focus? Is the white balance right? I mean, like on the low end, there's only a few things you have to get right to break your way into that kind of like paid category. You know, just get the bare minimum stuff done well. It should look good. It should sound good, you know, and then people will pay you for it because they trust you. Then it's a little bit harder to work your way up. And then maybe at some point you find like a natural, just like break even point where it's just like, yeah, this is where I'm comfortable working. Um, but then even then there's times where it's like, okay, maybe you can't quite afford it or you have to work with somebody who's going to take slightly like a pay cut. Or maybe you know somebody who you can pay a little bit less than maybe what it's worth, but you do something with two people then you can have, you know, double the coverage, make it look like it's this multi-camera thing because it is make it look like multicam before, but then actually do it multicam and just keep layering it up, adding the elements in, you know, have somebody eventually like just do the lighting or, or hire, you know, hair and makeup for the day. So now you have this, you know, kind of makeup artist there who's going to make the people look even better. 
That's one of the few things that people overlook on the low end projects is hair and makeup. It's really, really valuable just for making people feel confident on camera, but then also after the fact, looking at it and going like, wow, I look good. Men, women, it doesn't matter. Having just like a good, solid, like natural makeup artist who knows what they're doing with hair and makeup, it can make, it separates a lot of the low end stuff from like that second tier up where it looks better because hair and makeup was done. If you can't afford it, you can always do it yourself. A lot of it is very like basic, simple things that anyone can learn how to do. But that's where I was talking about before where you got into it because you're into cameras and then now you're learning about hair and makeup. You're like, what? But it, it all helps add to where the final product looks like it cost way more than maybe it actually did. So then the next go around, you can charge more. That stair-stepping, so incredibly valuable. I uh, love listening to you, Strons. You are very unbiased and down to the art. I try, I mean, yeah. Um, I say I try to be, but I also don't, I don't have to try. Like, if you've never done a live stream, like, I literally cannot stop talking. If I stop talking, it's dead air. So I don't have time to take stuff from my brain and spit out lies or tell half-truths. I can only process pure truth because, like, I don't have time to lie in between. Uh, so maybe that's why it feels very unbiased because it is. It's just very unfiltered. If I stop talking, it feels very, very awkward. It's just dead air. And I'm sure, you know, if someone's listening to this after the fact, they like look at their at their phone. Did it, did it pause? They're like, oh, did it, is it loading? You know, so I have to keep talking because there's no one there's no one else that's going to fill the silence. So even with my ums and ahs, like I try and at least make some noise. <laughs> so it's not just complete silence of me just clicking away at a keyboard. So I, I like to uh, just talk as much as I can, but there's really no time to filter it uh, in that way. So hopefully that comes across well. And, it, you know, it sounds like I appear unbiased, which I am, uh, it'd be very hard to, to fake it, I suppose. Cause eventually like doing a live stream every night, it, it would, it would slip. The cracks would, would show. Right. So that's why I like it. It's like just pure and transparent in a way that sometimes other content that's more edited and rehearsed and refined and scripted just isn't, you always wonder, okay, is this really what you believe? Or did you just write it? Cause it sounds good. It's always a question that comes to my mind. Trevor says, I've asked other filmmakers if they still aspire to an Alexa, given all the progress that's been made in dynamic range and color science by other manufacturers. There's the FX9, the C500 Mark II, the Ursa Mini Pro, Ursa 12K, S1H, all of which represent certain milestones in image quality that creep closer and closer to Alexa. Do you still aspire to Alexa? Do you think Alexa can maintain their lead indefinitely? I've shot with Alexa once. Was it worth it? No. And did I love the image quality the same way everyone else talks about image quality? No, I didn't. Uh, even the GH like Alexa LUT that supposedly makes you know the GH look like the Alexa, uh, the GH5 that is, I don't particularly like how it looks like right off the go. Like it, it's it's fine, it's whatever. There, but there's not anything magical to me about the Alexa other than at the time it was in some ways better than red and airy has made the Alexa better and better and better. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think there's anything all that special about it considering a lot of the stuff that you can do now with DaVinci resolve or even just in basic color grading in premiere with some of this footage that's you know, really like has the full dynamic range. You can shift the colors any which way you want. You're not limited to like a three-way color corrector, you know, in the way it used to be in Final Cut, how I used to color grade stuff back in the day. It's like you really have so much control and precision over the image that there's nothing that like the Alexa should be able to do that like you couldn't replicate. It may be harder. It may take you a few extra steps. You may not have quite the dynamic range in certain situations, but... With the Ursa Mini Pro, I'd struggle to have it, you know, clip both high end and low end and have something that's like totally out of the dynamic range of the camera. It's just not the way I film content. Granted, there might be certain times where if you're like in a dark interior and you're trying to expose for the inside and the outside and you're not using any lights, theoretically you could run into a problem, but that's just like not, that's not a situation where you should be using a high end camera anyway, because it sounds like you should invest in lights instead of 
you know, the, a camera that can capture the full dynamic range. It's kind of what I talked about earlier with the A7S and the A7S II. Just because a camera has this amazing dynamic range or it's, it shoots raw or it's really good in low light, it doesn't mean that you can just get rid of other things like lights. Lights are really, really important. So I don't care how much dynamic range you have, you still need lights, in which case nowadays things like the 300D Mark II, incredibly powerful. There's even more powerful lights that are cheaper. There's the nice photo 3300 or something like that. I think it's a stop brighter than the 300D. Uh, it's kind of cheaper build quality, but there's tons of high powered uh, LED lights. And there's the 600D, which I don't know if those are shipping yet, but like that's a thing. So, you know, dynamic range, you know, the tonality of an image, the color, like all this stuff is so flexible and pliable in a way that it wasn't maybe when Red and Alexa were like the, the top dogs in cinema. And they still are because they have the, the notoriety and they make cameras for that very specific purpose. But there's many people who can film with far less nowadays and still achieve the same stunning results. I think the S1H is a solid contender. I think the pocket cinema cameras from Blackmagic are fantastic. I think the stuff that comes out of the Ursa Mini looks pretty much flawless in a lot of situations. So it's really up to the individual and how they're using the tool, what the situations are, and then how they're processing the footage that matters far more than like, you know, is this camera technically better than the Alexa? It's like, I don't know that it really matters anymore because things have gotten so good across the board in a lot of ways. Um, let's see, Bart says, always have a small makeup kit on hand. Yeah, makeup goes a long way, a long, long way, just for making people feel comfortable. But then in the final, the final product, I mean, I could probably afford to have some makeup on right now, right? Just blotting down the shininess of skin goes a long way in making people just look better on camera, where it's more of like a matte finish than like shiny and sweaty. That one small difference in the way the light hits the face and the way the camera sees it it just it adds a pristine quality to your image that you you're not going to get if you don't have uh you know makeup on set totally agree with the hair and makeup it's worth it absolutely and like if you have um you know people like almost everybody has mild like imperfections in their skin um like not in addition to, you know, the shininess, but also just in like the color pattern. You can fix some of that with color grading, but it's so much better just to do it right on set with proper, just like hair and makeup. Cause that's something you never see in, in a film in a feature film anyway, is bad skin. Every Hollywood production has the budget for hair and makeup. They make these people look their absolute best, right? Like if you see them, you know, without hair and makeup, they look like like just creatures, you know, they don't even look like human. You're like, what? That's what you look like? And then they put them on camera, they do hair and makeup. And you're like, oh, that's that famous celebrity I know and love. So just doing that slight transition for just regular, you know, average Joes, put them on camera, you give them the hair and makeup treatment and all those problems, blemishes, little tidbits and, and things that are just never there in a Hollywood film. When you get rid of those in a low end production, it immediately graduates it to this kind of next level of like, wow, this looks good. And it, oh, it sounds good and shallowed up the field and it's properly lit and the color grade. Wow, those skin tones look really nice. And wow, check out that dynamic range. And that person looks really good. Now it starts to feel more cinematic and like a Hollywood production because of that one little thing of doing hair and makeup. Because that is in every TV show, in every movie, they're always doing it to make these people look a certain way. And so if you don't do it at all, on or just like a you know indie project or a you know corporate shoot or whatever it's going to it's never it doesn't matter what camera you have it's always going to look kind of low end because it just doesn't have the one thing that's universal across every big budget feature and that's hair and makeup maybe i should do a whole separate video on that cuz it's a it is a good topic that i think doesn't get uh, a lot of attention Bart Johnson says, I do live streams as well. I love it. People get to see me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Do a call-in show. I could absolutely set something like that up. I don't know exactly how I'd go about doing it, but it's something on my mind of like having more than just me, you know, having other people to talk to, I think would be fun. Loved my original Ursa Mini 4.6K. 
Yeah, Ursa Mini is fantastic. The Area Alexa LF is godly. They cut no corners on that camera. Beautiful engineering. Uh, oh, Strons, I forgot. You really got to try the Z Cam with the END. I really do. I, you know, was looking at it the other day, like ready to, but I have the Ursa Mini Pro. It's hard for me to justify the Z Cam when I already have something that does basically what the Z Cam does, and the Z Cam doesn't offer me anything new or different. If it was more of like, you know, something to offset from the GH5, so I maybe, but like that's really what I'm looking at is like what's after the GH5? Is it the GH6? Is it the S5? Is it the A7S3? But what's in that that bracket that's like the handheld, image stabilization, flip screen, autofocus, like the run and gun hybrid dream. What's that camera? Right now it's a GH5 for me and... Uh, yeah, I just don't think the Z Cam does it for me, but it looks awesome. Like if I didn't have uh, an Ursa Mini, uh, I'd probably get the Z Cam or like the Pocket 6K, one of the two. I don't know which one I would ultimately resolve myself to get. Right now, if Blackmagic came out with something after the Pocket 6K, like that I also think will be very, very exciting. Because that should be, if they fix everything wrong about the Pocket 6K, which there's very little wrong with it, but things like battery life, if they can do some autofocus or, you know, if they can add stabilization of some kind, I don't know, make it more like a hybrid, I think would be really cool and, uh, make that a really solid contender in that kind of two to $3,000 price point. Lighting is probably as or more important than your camera. Yes, absolutely. Christian lighting is way more important. Yeah. Uh, what are a few of your favorite YouTube channels you'd recommend or have learned from Kelvin? Let's see. What are the, my favorite YouTube channels? Um, I mean, Caleb Pike over at DSLR video shooter, like his stuff, he's just been rock solid for the past. How long has he been doing it? Probably 10 years. I imagine he always just has really good content. I feel like it's straight to the point. Like he talks about interesting stuff that you may not have seen steers more towards that like budget friendly uh lineup ball still dabbling in some higher end stuff but it's never like the crazy like high-end rigs at least that i've seen from him uh uh gerald undone obviously like incredibly popular person on youtube i think but like oddly like doesn't have that many subscribers but the people who like are in the know know about gerald like everybody knows about Gerald because his videos are just such technical deep dives and so good uh, in that regard, which I really appreciate. Um, I'm trying to think of other people I've learned from. I mean, way back when, I mean, when I was like first watching YouTube, it was Jared Poland and Frono's photo. I mean, I think one of the first videos I ever saw of his was him talking about, uh, Ken Rockwell and how Ken Rockwell shoots JPEGs and Jared, you know, I shoot raw, like the whole birth of the, I shoot raw thing. And, you know, it's like a fun, fun guy, uh, makes, interesting videos, I suppose. They're much more of like that photography. Uh, sometimes I get a little silly, kind of goofy, but you know, I respect him for what he does because he's been doing it. Uh, I think, I mean, probably one of the longest people on YouTube in the, in this space. Obviously, Philip Bloom uh, is there as well, but he doesn't post as, as much and it's definitely not, you know, your, your typical daily check-in style YouTube content. Who else? Who else on YouTube? Do I look at or do I watch regularly? Um, I'm sure there's people I'm like forgetting of. Curtis Judd is really good when it comes to like audio, microphones, audio recorders, that kind of stuff. He does a really good job. Uh, I used to watch Digital Rev back in the day when was it Kai and he was doing the Digital Rev stuff. He's since gone on to do his own thing which I just, I don't watch as much anymore for whatever reason. Um, it's just not really my style. And then who else is it like that? Like Indie Mogul, like I used to watch Film Riot back in the day, but it's like also not really my my style. That's more of like indie film, which as much as we talk about filmmakers and cinema, I'm not really like an indie film person, uh, as maybe odd as that sounds. I have done some indie film type things like short films and, and independent projects, but it's not like my passion. Um, I can't think of anyone else. If anyone else comes to mind, I'll, I'll shout them out. But um, those are the main ones that come to mind. If there's any others that like I should be aware of, put them in the chat as well. 
Because like YouTube is such a big place, and that's the thing. You'll always be like, you like, how have I never seen this person before? And they've got you know half a million subscribers, and you've just like never watched their stuff. Oh, the other person I've I've enjoyed watching recently is uh, Dustin Armstrong. He does. Uh, he's been. He did a lot of S1H stuff, so that's how I came across his channel. Mm, so. Yeah, he's got Dustin Armstrong. His like channel, I think it's relatively small, like a thousand to two thousand subscribers, um, but does a really good job making content. Uh, he talks about the S1H, so I enjoy his stuff. Um, I don't. It's not anything like super high end or like mind blowing, but like he does a good job talking about a camera that not a lot of other people talk about. And he's done like multiple videos, not just like the one and done review of like here it is, but just like the ongoing. Uh, things to know about the S1H I find valuable. So you can check out his stuff. He's definitely one, like a person who, and I think he does, I think he does like wedding type stuff. I, I gather from his work. That's sort of what I, I think he does, but I don't know 100%. And I think he's in, I think he's in Utah. He does live streams every once in a while. I tuned in his live stream the other night. Let's see, maybe do a test with good lighting and the GH1, a good live stream topic. Ooh. That would be a good live stream topic. Thank you, Steve. The GH1, yeah, like I, I've thought about doing that. Like GH1, shooting something with the 5D Mark IV, shooting something with the Ursa Mini, shooting something with the GH5, but like different things and putting it all in together in one video and then just being like, which is which camera. Um, I think sometimes those are fun, but also maybe really obvious too, like when you compare 4K to 1080. Might just give it away, but if you're comparing them side by side in like in purely just a video that's 1080 which a lot of videos still are you can probably get away with uh you know like a gh1 a gh2 for sure lights make a huge difference to the quality of an image especially in digital filmmaking due to the way the digital sensor processes color as opposed to the way film does so are you talking about the like, calis are you talking about the different types of lights or just lights in general because uh, yeah like you absolutely need light, but are you talking about LED versus fluorescent versus you know incandescent, that kind of thing? Or are you just saying in general? Look at someone like Ann Barry on YouTube shooting on a black magic pocket 4K and making cinematic images with great lighting. Ann Barry, has Ann Barry been in the chat before? Um, I feel like that uh, name looks very, very familiar. So thank you, uh, Trevor, for letting, for shouting that one out. Uh, creatures. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I lost my so many 4.6k in the fire and had insurance money. So I took a leap on the E2 F6. Well, the great thing about the Z cam, uh, is smaller than the Ursa mini, right? Like there's a mini is not mini at all. And I like smaller in a lot of ways is better. You do, it is less stable. You know, the Ursa mini has like a weight and like girth to it. So when you move it, it's not shaking all over the place. But uh, there are some benefits to having a smaller camera, for sure. Amber's content is especially good. I'll check it out. I shoot most of my YouTube stuff on the Pocket 6K. A Pocket 6K is a lovely camera as well. I'm not sure what kind of Magic Panasonic is using, but the stabilization in their cameras are miles ahead of the pack. My GH5 never get the stretching and wobbling I'm seeing on the R5 and the A7S III. I heard that Bart Johnson Production is a pretty good channel. Um... I think I've seen, I've been over to Bart's channel, but yeah, Bart saying Bart is a good channel. Hey, that totally self-promotion. I'm all for it. It's totally fine. A lot of people on the internet are like, oh, don't self-promote. It's like how, who's going to do it for you at the beginning when you're an audience of one, you and yourself, you got to share it to other people. That's, that's how this thing works. So just by the very nature of showing up in the chat, Bart and Steve and all these people. Yeah. Like it's it's a good thing. If you're making content and you think it's good and worth watching, let other people know about it. Steve says, I'd be interested in your opinion on codecs between the two, which two became uh, Mr. Pro Photographer and Cheap Camera from Digital Rev. Tom Antos. Tom Antos is fantastic. Uh, I really like his stuff. Although I haven't seen his stuff as much recently. Andy Axe, I've seen a few videos, but not much to really know one way or the other. The C47, I don't know. I do know Film Riot. And then Lucas Pfaff, if that's how you say it. I've, I don't know who Lucas is, but I'll check him out. Gerald is the best camera reviewer. He is the king 
Uh, we talk a lot at 4x speed. Yeah, working on that one. Wolf Crow. Yeah, Wolf Crow's all right. I like that. I like his stuff. Um, he just did one on the R5, and I, I kind of disagree. I, don't, I feel like, um, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he talks about the R5 and how you can hook up an external recorder and you can record, you know, cheaper with the Ninja 5 with the R5 than this. Uh, CF Express cards, and you know, then you have an external monitor, and you get this external recorder, and since you have less to worry about with overheating, yada 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 yada. But then later talks about the S1H, and says the S1H doesn't do raw, but like the R5 does. And I was like, well, if you're going to give the R5 the benefit of the doubt with the external recorder, in these certain situations of like it being cheaper and it you know not cause not causing as many problems for the camera. Why don't you also give the benefit of the doubt to the S1H and do an external recorder to shoot raw? Like to me, that seems like a very, if you're going to make the exchange for one camera, you can't compare it to another and then not give that camera the benefit of the doubt in that situation as well. So it's like, yeah, the S1H doesn't record raw internal, but if you're using a monitor on the R5, like I would compare it to an S1H with a monitor. And then in that case, you can do raw if you really need to. So there's just some stuff like that that people get like, the make content, I'm sure I do it too, where I say something that's a contradictory or whatever, but it just is kind of like, it feels like, oh, you're making excuses for Canon, but then also complaining about the S1H, where like, I've talked about the S1H, like I've not, I don't think I've made an excuse for the autofocus, for Panasonic's autofocus, it's what everyone always complains about, the Panasonic cameras, that the autofocus is bad. And like, I don't, I don't think I ever make excuses for that other than like, well, I don't always shoot autofocus. I do shoot manual focus a lot. I guess that's kind of an excuse, but that's, I would shoot manual focus with any camera. So like it being there with the Canons and the Sony's being better, like, I think that is a, a benefit in that case. So I don't know. It just seems weird where some people make excuses for certain systems that they like, but then not for others, or they like downplay their strengths. And then, and then also downplay the weaknesses of what they like. I don't know. But again, maybe I'm reading into it too much. I don't actually know. Like his, you know, actual opinion. But he seemed pretty positive about the R5 in general without really acknowledging the grievances, I would su I suppose. Um, I got a shout out in an Andy X video. Made me feel like I made it. That's awesome, Bart. Philip Bloom, Potato Jet, Joshua Martin Studios. I don't know Joshua Martin. I do know Potato Jet. I don't know that I like get a lot from his videos other than like what these, you know, the cameras do or like what, uh, you know, like, uh, cause he does like a lot of, of the gear reviews across many different devices. And they're almost always like, this is amazing. And I, and then with like you a few setbacks, but like, at the, I kind of want, I don't know. I like it more of like, well, which one do you want to film with? Which one is like your personal favorite one rather than just saying like, they're all great or they're all awesome. Like it's the C300 Mark III and it's awesome. And oh, this is the red Komodo and it's awesome. And like this 360 camera is awesome. And you know, the A7S III is awesome. And the R5 is awesome. And the R6 is awesome. Like, yes, they're all awesome. Like I get it, but I kind of want to know like, like why, why you don't like it. And I think that is the difference too. When a lot of people see my content or my videos, they think I'm just, you know, complaining to complain or I just have a bad attitude. And like, that's not the case at all. I just am not a very like overly positive person about everything. I'm just more of kind of like, what's the, what's the catch? Like, what's the, you know, what's the little limitation? What's the thing that's going to bug me? Cause I get that all these cameras are amazing. I know what's the gripe that's going to, I'm going to be in the middle of a shoot and what's the camera going to do that's going to piss me off? Is it going to overheat? Is that what it is, Canon? All right. I don't want it, you know? Am I going to be in the middle of the shoot? You know, and like, at least with Panasonic, it's like, all right, I don't trust the autofocus. So I know not to rely on it. So I'm not going to, you know, be pissed off about that. But if it's like the Sony and it's like, oh, the autofocus is perfect. And it turns out it's not, or it also overheats or like, what's the catch? Is the, is the battery going to die all the time? Like on the Pocket 6K, you know, or the Pocket 4K? Like, is it just constantly eating through batteries? Is that the thing that's going to gonna get me and eat away at me and irritate me over time? Because, like, there's nothing on the Ursa Mini that I've been, like, bugged about. I don't, I can't think of, I can't think of, like, one thing. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll definitely let you know. But, like, that's what I look for. I look for the camera that's, like, not going to rub me the wrong way. It doesn't have to be the best at everything, but it just can't offend me. And maybe that's why I come across negative sometimes to some people who just, like, only want to hear 
all the great things that Canon is doing and like, it's got the best autofocus ever. Cool. I get it. But like, you don't understand that it's like also bad. Actually, I'm going to maybe do a fifth video here in a second. Cause this just sparked an idea that I had earlier that I just, I had a good analogy that I, that I have to get into so many people. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's tons of people on YouTube, which is fantastic. Uh, Matteo Bertoli got some of the best Blackmagic Cinema 6K footage on YouTube. Matteo Bertoli, all right, check him out. Thank you, Jayful. The DP Journey, or something similar, is the name of a good channel about grading. And then Cal says, I love Dustin, Trevor, yep. Sensor bear patterns can interact weirdly with some skewed lights. That's probably source of early digital not being great. I think Curtis Judd has videos about it. DP journey. Awesome. Sensor flaws plus light falls can converge in a bad way. Probably my new favorite right now, other than Strons, is media division. Mind blowing stuff. Media division. Awesome. I'll check it out. Trevor uh, was DP journey. The one who did the color grading GH5 tutorial. That was the boxing music video. I like Newman films. Yep. I got to go guys. See you Bart. Uh, love you all. Glad to see you back. Strons. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And I'm sorry to hear about your dog. That's really sad. Trevor, DP Journey is a technical deep dive channel. Fun hanging around here tonight. I'm out. Thanks for running these stream streams. Yeah, absolutely, Calvin. See you later. He has done some grading stuff too. Later, man. Hope your dog feels better. I have a love-hate relationship with the S1H. Uh, that's what Calla says. And then Indie Mogul. Yep, Indie Mogul. Potato Jet is a fun, charismatic personality. Good for a light introduction to gear without getting drowned in fanboy arguments. Just so entertaining and light and fun. Yeah, like I have nothing against... Uh, is a gene like he's like a very a pleasant guy to watch um but i'm just thinking like the people like i learned the most from definitely gerald but i feel like everybody knows that already and i'm trying to think of other people who've like really like either inspired or like taught something special that was like oh i didn't know that before or oh that's a really good it's a really good tip or that's really good advice i don't know i'm trying to think of like life-changing <laughs> life-changing YouTube videos. I don't know that I've seen too many. Just so entertaining, light, and fun. I told you Canon doesn't overheat. It's a software cripple to protect the Canon cinema camera line. Uh, I will see you later. Thanks for the live stream. Yeah, see you, Callus. So, as we've been talking about Canon, the R5 and the R6 overheating, I thought of a really good analogy. At least it, it, it made sense to me. I don't know if you'll agree. But when people say... The R5, the R6, they're great photography cameras. They overheat. So just, you know, go buy a video camera or whatever, you know, like that's fine. Or I talk about the S1H and the autofocus and, you know, like, oh, just go buy a, a Canon or a Sony instead. I thought of this really, it, this example struck me of you go to a restaurant, maybe it's a fast food joint, a local diner, whatever. You go and it's known for their burgers. They have the best burgers around. You go with a group of friends. And then there's a friend that says, you know, like, I'm not really in the mood for a burger. Like I'm going to do like the chicken, the chicken strips. And then you go, oh, but it's a burger place. You got to get the burger. They said, no, I just, I'm in the mood for chicken strips. And they get the chicken strips. You get the burger. The burger's delicious. The chicken strips are like frozen from a bag. They're just like this extra thing they probably have on like the kid's menu. It's not really what the place is known for. They have these bad chicken strips. And the person goes, man, these chicken strips are just not, not really that great not that great at all. I don't really like this spot. And you go, yeah, but you were supposed to be eating the burger. The person's like, yeah, but I was in the mood for chicken strips. Like that's what I wanted. And these were not that good. So I don't really like this spot, but it's known for the burger. Like you have to get the burger here. Well, well, I'm in the mood for chicken strips. A couple days later, you go to the chicken strip spot. You go to the chicken strip place, the place that's the local joint that's known for their, the best chicken around. Two friends go, person gets the chicken strips, and the other person goes, yeah, I'm really craving a burger today. I'm craving a burger. Sure enough, on the menu, they got a burger. They order the burger to sit down. Chicken strips, yes, the chicken is the best around, bar none. It's the best chicken. Burger, not half bad. It's not awful. It's not great. It's just so-so. It's just so-so. In that scenario, the experience for each of those people is kind of different, right? Like the person who got the burger was really happy over here and then they got a decent burger over here, but they would obviously prefer to go to the burger joint because they really like burgers. The chicken strip person, they had the best chicken strips and then the worst chicken strips. So they're 
only going to prefer the chicken place and they had a bad experience with the chicken over here. And that's kind of what I compare. I don't know if it's a terrible analogy, but I thought I, thought I kind of liked it. Comparing like the Canon R5, it might be the best burger you've ever had. It might have to be the best photography camera, the best autofocus, but these few crippling video features are like those really bad chicken strips where it's just like, I, I don't like it. I'm going to go over here where they have really good chicken strips and they have a decent burger as well. It might not be the best, but hey, it's it's pretty good. And the other person looks and says, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, like they got a good, good burger over there, but why are you hating on my thing over here? And it's like, I'm not hating. I'm not saying the R5 is bad. I'm not saying the R6 is bad for those features. I'm just saying it doesn't have what I personally want in the camera. And I thought that was a good analogy for like just the way people get worked up about cameras and their favorite food joints. Like people get passionate about what they're into and what their personal preference dictates, whether you like burgers or you like chicken strips, whether you're a photographer, a videographer, there's different cameras, different restaurants with different flavors, different tastes. And I think that can get lost when someone's complaining, like me probably, about the overheating on the R5 and the R6 and being like, these chicken strips are bad. And then the person's like, you came to a burger joint and you're expecting you know, good chicken strips, what's wrong with you? Like I get that argument. But at the same time, I would probably prefer to go to the place that has just like good food all around. The chicken strips are good. The burgers are good. The salads go okay. Like everything's like pretty decent. That way it satisfies a lot of needs rather than just like one. Like we only have chicken. We have nothing else. So I don't know if that's helpful in terms of like adding a little bit of context of how I view these cameras and, and what I actually think of them. Because again, I don't think the Canon R5 and the R6 are awful you know, no one should buy them. I think there's pieces of them that make them unusable for certain people who should not buy them. But if you are purely a photographer and you want the autofocus and you like the 45 megapixels on the R5 or you like the R6 for the price point, totally fine. Like have the best burger ever. That's fine. But just know that like I'm only talking about like the, the portion they served up on the side, those chicken strips, those video features that they said were going to be there and then they aren't actually there and they're kind of half baked and they're not all that good. I'm going to go over here and, and look at this other camera and say, wow, Sony did it right or Panasonic is doing it right. They're doing really good across all of these features. And maybe they're not the best, but they have a really good collection of offerings there. And that's kind of what I gravitate towards personally, because I'm kind of a, a pure hybrid shooter. Like I do both photo and video. I'm not exclusively one or the other. So having a camera that can do it all reasonably well is more important to me than one camera that can do one thing the best and then another thing kind of not at all. And that's kind of where I stand on it. It's not to be, you know, a fanboy one way or the other or, you know, throw shade at Canon or whatever. It's just to say there's different preferences for different people, different shooters. And I think there's kind of room for everybody. It's not about hate and criticism and doing stuff for clicks. It's just about talking about these things in, a, in an honest way so that the people who maybe do want a certain feature know what they're signing up for and they can make informed choices based upon it and just understanding why these cameras get made in the way they are made. So hopefully that can be some kind of signal feedback to Canon, to Sony, to Panasonic to say, hey, we like good autofocus. We don't like overheating. These things are good. These things are bad. And then being the cameras being judged accordingly so that improvements can be made for the future, which I think is really, really valuable. And what the this whole conversation is really all about. Let's see. Uh, uh, just entertain. I told you can't doesn't overheat. See you later. Odd. Uh, one of my messages was cut from your screen. Which one was cut, Christian? There was one that, like, a message. Like, I see sometimes the messages get retracted. I assume that's people doing it, but are they censored because you, you put a naughty word in there or something? Uh, Shane Hobbit puts out some good stuff too, but it's mostly behind a paywall. Yeah, Steve, that's the problem with Shane's content is that it's all, you know, sign up for his inner circle and well, that's fine. I think, you know, it's like his business model and he's obviously, you know, a talented guy, uh, working professionally. It is mm, unfortunate that more of it isn't more widely available or the stuff that is available doesn't, isn't always as relatable as you might want it to be where I feel like you definitely get that from some of the people who aren't in Hollywood, 
where it's like, here's how to make Hollywood style images without it being in Hollywood, which I find more satisfying. I'll push Baron uh, Gaylord's cha channel. Baron Gaylord, I don't know who Baron Gaylord is, but thanks for uh, shouting him out. I feel like people feel the need to defend the fact that the R5 works in some ways for them by defending the camera. You don't have to defend everything about the camera if it works for you. Absolutely, and, and Trevor, and that goes back to the, we've talked about it many, many times, but the, you know, go buy a video camera is such a stupid argument. You know, it's like, that's, but that, we're talking about the R5. Like we're talking about the R5 and that it overheats. We're not talking about like going to buy a video camera. We're talking about the camera that's right in front of us that has this issue that we're all wondering like why it's happening. Did they do it on purpose? Is this a incompetence? Like wh why did this happen? And then also wondering, hey, is there a way we can fix this? Because if we can fix this, this would be an awesome camera. And then if we can fix it, why didn't Canon? Uh, I'll only be satisfied when someone offers me a full turducken and it has to cost $900. <laughs> uh, it's basically just a camera with some great things and some severe shortcomings. That doesn't mean you can't buy it. You don't have to defend the broken stuff. Yeah, I don't defend the S1H Chromie autofocus. I love it for all the other stuff, but the autofocus, I have to admit, compared to Canon and Sony, is just bad. So what? Uh, yeah, just admit it. Just say it's bad and say like, well, I you know I don't do autofocus. Like I do manual focus. So like, yeah, but it's bad. Like if it's bad, and admit it's bad. And then people say, yeah, I don't do video, and it's like, okay, great. Like yeah, you, so you don't use video on the R5. Awesome, cool, no problem. It's when it turns into like the arguments, like, oh, you're just hating for clicks and go buy a video camera. It's like, I don't, I, I, I try and make these videos very nice, very mellow, very low key. Like, I don't think I'm spouting hate here, you know, about Canon or the R5. In fact, I think I've said, in, I think every video I've ever made about the R5 or the R6, I like say, these are great cameras. They look, I was wanted to buy them. Like, I say everything good about them. But then it's like pointing out these like couple setbacks and people lose their minds um, over the stuff. It's just really unnecessary, I guess, because it's it's um, it's the it's the thing. It's like arguing about like the restaurants, which is why I kind of like that analogy because I've been in situations like that before. So that's like kind of based off of you know real life conversations. People ordering like the wrong thing at a restaurant. Well, you don't get that here. They're not a chicken place they're a burger place and it's like well i want chicken i don't know what to tell you like i'm gonna get what i want and then you know the person who brought you is mad oh you're not gonna have a bad experience it's like well i didn't i didn't want a burger i wanted chicken so i don't know what to tell you agree completely on the r5 r6 i still think people not affected by the crippling could be annoyed by the r5 being bad engineering without cooling unable to operate in video says something about quality yeah if the black magic pocket cinema 6k had autofocus everybody would go out of business and i think it's coming Ooh, j full Ooh, yeah if black magic gets autofocus together and if they're able to do some kind of stabilization some kind of ibis that would be that would be awesome i think the ibis is maybe less of a of a necessity because people you know rig out the uh, pocket 6k and 4k with uh, shoulder rigs and you know cages and whatnot so but it is helpful to have, right? All of these things are helpful just to round out the whole camera as a whole. And when you're looking at, you know, the spreadsheets of like, well, this one has this, but this one doesn't, and this one has this, and this one doesn't, but this one's more expensive and this one's cheaper. Like adding it all up, you have to take all those things to an account. And so, yeah, the more features you can stack in your favor, which is basically what Sony has done with the A7S III, they're just like, yep, we've got all of them. We've got every little feature you want. And like the one thing is that it's, low megapixels, but I think a lot of people are very forgiving of that and they don't really mind all that much. They're like, okay, great. Like, cool. 12 megapixels. That's fine. Like they don't. So it's like Sony checks so many of those boxes where, you know, everyone else has their kind of shortcomings here or there. And we'll see the A7S III could have some crippling, you know, defect, but I don't know. I don't know. I haven't shot with it myself, so I can't, I can't speak to that. Let's see. Any device priced as a pro tool should be engineered professionally. Absolutely. They should have done their best. And if that's their best, I'd be curious to know, you know, is there another company that's going to do it? You know, basically saying, okay, we've got a camera that can shoot 8K RAW, that can do 4K 120 from a full frame sensor, no crop. So if they can do it and it overheats, well, who's going to do it and just keep it from overheating? 
Because if they can do that for the same price or similar or maybe slightly cheaper, well, then all of a sudden, you know, that you're going to have a lot of people who want those features and they're going to look elsewhere. They're going to look away from Canon. But it the, the great thing about Canon was that it had all the other features that Canon does get right. The autofocus, stabilization, well, maybe not the best. I mean, it's all arguable. Like, it's it's still nice to have the flip screen, the RF lenses, like the high megapixel sensor. If you go to the R6, it's 20 megapixels. Like those are good features uh, that would be really nice to have in addition to all the other ones, which is why I think both of those cameras are so tragic that they should have done a better job engineering. Good autofocus like the 5D Mark IV, uh, right image stabilization as well. The Pocket 4K Micro Four Third and also the 6K do support lenses with stabilization though, and you can get decent results. That is true, and uh, so does the Ursa. Well, it depends. I, it's usually I turn it off because like sometimes it can be wonky and it can like it can shift too much. I don't know about on the uh, Pocket cameras, but I've definitely noticed on the Ursa, um, the G1. I don't know about the G2. I haven't tested it enough, but with you know the lens stabilization, because the lens basically is thinking it's for photography it does these jerky stabilization moves that don't like look quite right in video mode. At least that's what I've noticed shooting with the Ursa with lens stabilization on. So I usually will turn that off and you'll see it in like if you're shooting slow motion, you know, 4K 60 or something like that. And then like the 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 image itself will kind of like jerk as like the stabilization is like really kicking in. And it's doing it because it thinks you're taking a photo, but you're trying to shoot video and it's just moving you know, moving the, the lens element to stabilize and it just kind of looks kind of funky. So I usually turn it off, but um, maybe it work, does work better on the pocket cameras. I don't actually know. Can the 5D Mark IV compete with the Blackmagic Pocket 6K in any way, like in particular image quality? Uh, I don't know how, I, I really wouldn't compare those. Although I do suppose, like I just, I don't, I don't really shoot video on the 5D Mark IV. So I don't know what they did in terms of firmware updates, but I know when it came out, it was 4K, severely cropped, really inefficient codec. And was C-Log added later? As a, Was it a paid thing on the 5D Mark IV? Or did they never add C-Log? It's so hard to keep track of some of this stuff because when the camera comes out, you have to like track it the whole time. And if you kind of like write it off at the beginning of saying like, well, I'm just, that's not for me. You know, I think with the R5 and the R6, like the overheating thing, if Canon doesn't fix that initially, it'll those cameras will be ri- those cameras will be written off, and I don't know that they'll get a second chance to like for people to come back. Same thing is true with Panasonic and the autofocus on their cameras. Even though they've done, you know, improvements to the autofocus systems with firmware updates and stuff, it's usually like what's released at launch is kind of the the branding that the camera gets. I would equate it to. Uh, no Man's Sky, the video game that launched abysmal reviews. People hated it. They said, this is awful. It's too simple. It's just nothing like what we were promised. In a lot of ways, the R5 and the R6, I think there's some strong parallels to No Man's Sky in terms of like making promises and then not delivering upon that potential. But, you know, uh, Hello Games, the developer of No Man's Sky, like turned that all around, did a bunch of firmware patches, like all sorts of releases to kind of bring new life into the game. And now I think it has a a relatively popular like fan base and and following, but what could have been there at launch, they lost so much of that like reputation that they had to work, you know, 10 times as hard to build it back. And thankfully they put in the work to do it, but I still don't think it's anywhere near as successful as that game could have been had they, you know, launched in a better place or maybe not promise as much up front. And it was more of just like this kind of quirky little indie game that started somewhere and then built big instead of being, you know, setting this super high expectation and then falling off the face of a cliff when everyone was like, that's it. That's all there is. You know, same thing with the R5 and the R6. Maybe, I don't know what they could have done different because if they hadn't had those features on the camera, I don't think people like us would have even been paying attention at all. It would have just been like, oh, another Canon camera that like shoots 4K 30. Like, cool. Okay. Like no one would have paid any attention. It's because of those video features, I think, that put it out there at the forefront of like, whoa, this is coming. This is incredible. Like 8K RAW, 4K 120. Oh my God. It was all the video features that hyped it up like and put a lot of eyeballs on those cameras. And then all those eyeballs were there and all of them saw 
the huge problems with the overheating and we're like, oh, okay, so yeah, this is a, a dumpster fire. Uh, let's see, IBIS. Uh, IBIS, autofocus requires camera manufacturer to be good at physics. A classic cinema camera is just a sensor, much easier to produce by a smaller team, mostly electronics and no mechanics. Black Magic Pocket Cinema, original, looked weird with some Panasonic stabilized lenses. GH5 haven't looked weird with any lens. Seems integration is important. Camera not aware of what lens does can get weird. Yeah, I don't know why that happens the way it does on certain cameras versus others, because that is something on the GH5 it seems to work better. Maybe it being a photo camera has something to do. I, I don't know what that would be, just the communication with the electronics. Maybe there's more advanced communication there. On the, G, on the GH5 with the uh, Metabones versus like what's happening on the Ursa. I don't know. But in general, I usually turn the stabilization off because I don't feel like it adds a whole lot, especially because the Ursa is just relatively stable as is. It's so big that the inertia and the mass keeps it relatively stable. Whereas, you know, a much smaller camera, you're going to need that because even the smallest jitter and shake is going to be noticeable in your footage. I think I'll wrap it up there been streaming well long enough. This was a late Friday night. This was a long stream, but I do appreciate it. I have fun doing these and ended up doing like five little videos. So I only had three planned. So let me know. I would be curious what your thoughts are on my chicken strip burger analogy, if that makes sense, or if that's just the ramblings of someone awake at midnight who needs some sleep. I don't know. I don't know one way or the other. It made sense to me in my head, but you know, sometimes you think things and then you say them and you go, do people know what I'm talking about? Or do they think I'm talking about literal chicken strips and cameras? Like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what you guys uh, think. And I look forward to next time because I enjoy doing these. They're a lot of fun. And yeah, next time might be a slightly different setup. We'll see. Who knows? Until then.